Melnick outdoor game hinted at moving the club if finances didn't improve. The hashtag Melnick out was a thing for a while. Plans to build an arena at the LeBreton flat site fell apart. Previous health battles included the need for a liver transplant in 2015. The donors said the motivation was for Melnick to bring a Stanley Cup home. Eugene Melnick was 62 years old. Simon Bennett, City News. City News time, 9.01. Now your forecast with meteorologist Jill Taylor. Well, we're okay for today with sun and cloud, the high near zero, but we're already under a special weather statement for Wednesday with snow, ice pellets, freezing rain possible Wednesday afternoon and Wednesday night. So heads up for that. For today, the high zero. And right now in both Ottawa and in Smith Falls, it's minus 9 degrees. We're expecting Provincial Transportation Minister Caroline Mulrooney to announce today the 110 speed limit on select six designated portions of the 400 series highways will be made permanent. According to the Canadian press, a couple of more pilot projects are going to be added to that list. They are both well outside our region. But the 110 will be made permanent on April 22nd in places like the 417, pretty much from Ottawa to the Quebec border and also Canada to Arnprior. City News Time 902 face-to-face -face talks underway in Turkey this morning between Russia and Ukraine ahead of the talks in Istanbul. Ukraine's president said his country is prepared to declare its neutrality and is open to compromise over the contested eastern region of Donbass. Former UK NATO representative Peter Rickett says he doesn't believe Russia will give up the key city of Mariupol though and that could hold up any peace agreement. It will be unstable and it will guarantee that fighting will flare up again in the future. I don't want to predict that, but I think that's probably more likely than a signed and sealed peace deal any time in the foreseeable future. Now, this morning's talks raise flickering hope of progress to end the more than one-month-old war that has ground into a bloody campaign of attrition. Ukraine's President Zelensky is again pressing Western countries to do more to support Ukraine, adding hesitancy by Western nations to stand up to Moscow makes them partially responsible for the destruction in his country. And that was from a video that was posted to social media last night. Historic Westminster Abbey, the scene today of the Prince Philip Memorial Service. The bells of the Abbey marking the memorial service in honor of the Queen's late husband, who died nearly a year ago. His funeral at St. George's Chapel at Windsor was severely restricted due to the pandemic. So this gathering contained many of the elements left out last year, focusing on his devotion to duty. Walking the Queen in, Prince Andrew, just a few weeks after his out-of-court sexual abuse settlement, notably absent Harry and Meghan, who stayed in the States. Tom Rivers, ABC News, London. And I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. bad or complicated there's no news in ottawa and the valley he won't talk about it's the rob snow show on rogers tv and city news 1011 fm and 1310 a.m it is springtime right did, did mother nature get the memo that it's springtime Way below zero double digit wind chills, special weather statements. Come on, Mother Nature. Give a guy a break. Good morning. Welcome to the Rob Snow Show on City News. We have much to get into this morning. The news, your views on the news. That's what we do around here. Uh, terrible news from the from the Ottawa Senators this morning. I did not expect to wake up to that news. Uh, that Eugene Melnick, the owner of the Ottawa Senators, has died at the age of 62 after what's being described as a long illness, according to the club and the, and the National Hockey League. Whatever you may think of the man, he was a complicated man. That leaves behind a, a complicated legacy. 62, too young, too young. Um, I will say the reason the Ottawa Senators are still the Ottawa Senators it's because of Eugene Melnick. He's, he's the reason the senators are still here and they're not playing in some American city like Portland or someplace. He saved the team. And I do believe the news reports that he loved his hockey team and that he really wanted nothing more than to see his hockey team win the Stanley Cup. Big local story. Sad story. Many layers. Lots of history to it. 
And uh, we are lucky to be able to call upon Wayne Scanlon, longtime hockey columnist, now writing about the Ottawa Senators for Sportsnet.ca. And uh, he'll join us coming up shortly here on the Rob Snow Show. After the 9.30 news, Professor Ian Lee from the Sprott School of Business at Carleton University. And he has the Conservative Party's leadership on the brain this week. And he thinks that Pierre Polyev is winning this thing going away right now. Not everyone thinks that, of course. There are more than a few people who think uh, Polyev is spending too much time, too much time uh, trying to court, um, well, what some people think are the fringe elements of the conservative movement, and they think Polyev is more than happy to drive the campaign bus right into crazy town. And uh, those that say that will then usually point to Jean Charest. And they'll say things like, this is why Jean Charest is a much better choice for the leader of the Conservative Party because he doesn't wander into crazy town. So the reason this is even in the news is because of uh, Polyev's latest musings about crypto. Even though it wasn't really so much about crypto as, as, as much as it was, I thought, about blockchain, wanting to make Canada a leader on blockchain, I think that's totally legitimate. Um, when I interview people in that area, uh, crypto and blockchain, to me, what I'm taking away from it, the coins aren't the story. It's, it's not really about the tokens, whether it's Bitcoin or Ethereum or any of the other ones. There are all kinds of cryptocurrencies, currencies, which is a stretch to even call them currencies. The much more exciting side of it is the blockchain technology. That's what really uh, gets people excited, lights people up. And um, absolutely, if Canada can become a leader than that, uh, you know, that's an admirable goal because what the experts have told me is that blockchain... Blockchain is going to be part of the architecture of all kinds of industries in the future in all kinds of profound ways. And, you know, maybe it's just hype. There's probably a certain amount of hype to it. But they talk like it's the, you know, they compare it to the early days of the Internet when it comes to talking about blockchain. And that we're still in the days of, uh, like, dial-up and free net and news groups and <laughs> things like that. Polyev might lose people when he starts talking about, you know, the central bankers debasing our currency. Um, some people think that, you know, going, going a bit too far outside of the mainstream there. But anyway, uh, we'll, we'll get into that with Professor Ian Lee this morning and talk about another big news story today. And that's what the Trudeau government is doing on the West Coast. Uh, yesterday it was child care with Doug Ford and the big announcement in Brampton. And then later in the afternoon, it was the defense minister and the procurement minister and the big stunning admission that, yes, um, <laughs> We've wasted years of everyone's time, and we will buy the F-35 fighter jet from Lockheed Martin. In fact, Lockheed Martin will take 88 of them. Thank you very much, and the sooner you can deliver those, the better. <laughs> it's unbelievable, unbelievable turn of events. Today, it's back into something that is more near and dear to the Trudeau liberals' hearts and brains and that is fighting climate change, fighting climate change. More targets will be announced today for greenhouse gas emission reductions. Targets, 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 targets. This is the great Canadian government tradition. Okay, If fighting climate change is an important issue for you, then you are probably aware of this grand tradition that we have in this country. Governments setting targets 
and then blowing right through the targets. Paul Martin's government did it. Stephen Harper's government did it. And so has this government under Prime Minister Trudeau, despite all the talk. Okay, that's all it has ever been. Talk. Because greenhouse gas emissions under this government, this carbon taxing government, this pipeline canceling government, greenhouse gas emissions under this government have only ever gone up. Remember, this is the prime minister who prefers two jet airplanes for his election campaign. Each and every year, Mr. Trudeau has been prime minister, despite declaring a climate emergency, despite meeting with Greta in Montreal, despite sending up hundreds to Paris, and then hundreds more to Glasgow for climate negotiations and talks and schmoozes about the climate crisis, despite bringing in a carbon tax, and jacking up the carbon tax later this week, it's all been talk and nothing more. Emissions in this country have only gone in one direction, and that is up. All the time, Mr. Trudeau has been prime minister. So today, new targets. In six years under this government, Emissions have only gone up, but now, but now, somehow, some way, they're going to be cut in half, almost in half, okay? 45% is the new target. Emissions will be cut by 45% by the year 2030? Eight years from now? Eight years from now. How are they going to do that? Wouldn't you like to know? I would like to know. All is to be revealed in Vancouver, British Columbia today. The Prime Minister is there. He flew there. The Environment Minister is there. So is the Natural Resources Minister. That's how big it is. It's kind of a big deal. New climate change targets today. Meantime, the carbon tax goes up on Friday and Canadians are left to wonder, why does life keep getting so expensive in Justin Trudeau's world? We will talk about that with syndicated columnist Michael Tobe and with you, I hope, during the Talk Back Hour. We do the Talk Back Hour every morning here on the Rob Snow Show between 10 and 11 o'clock. 750-1310, the call in line. It was very busy yesterday. I'd love to hear from you what you think about these new climate change targets, a cut of 45% in greenhouse gases in just eight years. How are we ever going to do that without killing the economy at the same time? Isn't that going to be quite a balancing act? Emissions, they go up each and every year for six years. And then what? We just flick a switch and suddenly they're going to start going down? How are we going to cut greenhouse gas emissions in this country within eight years by almost half? Do you have any ideas? I'd love to hear them. And then I want to ask you about some local things. I want to ask you about the state of the roads. Are the roads in this city actually getting worse? David's like, yep. What? Yeah. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Yeah. Really? I've okay. lived here my whole life. I'm telling you what, the city council insists we're putting all kinds of money into fixing up the roads. Some councillors think we spend too much money fixing up the roads. But are the roads in Ottawa getting any better, or are they actually getting worse? And there's one road in particular I want to ask you about in the future of it, Wellington Street. Okay. Wellington Street is still closed. In the aftermath of the occupation, should it ever reopen to traffic? Or should it remain closed? See, a lot on our plate this morning on the Rob Snow Show on City News.
I'm Emily Bertrand, the owner of Royale Equestrian Center. Uh, this is Diamond. She's a 10-year-old thoroughbred. She used to be a racehorse um, and then made the transition to a riding horse. She loves jumping and she's used for our more advanced students. So we started the farm 14 years ago um, with my mom and brother. My brother was actually driving by one day and saw the sign and we applied. There were 60 applicants and we got it. Um, when we first started, there was not very much here, so our property is about 25 acres and there was just this 100 year old barn. And from there we built onto it. We fixed up one stall at a time, one paddock at a time. We added one horse at a time and slowly it built into what it is today. Uh, every year we're improving and trying to continue to build. Um, and most recently we added two Shedro barns this year. I love horses. I've been obsessed with horses since I was a little girl. Uh, the first time I got to ride, I was four years old and I just loved it. My mom thought it was gonna be a phase and that phase never ended. I kept riding all through high school and then eventually, you know, started Royale Equestrian Center. It was my dream to always own a farm and to build a place that I could share my passion for horses with others and do the same thing for the kids that the horses did for me. So I absolutely love it. It's a dream come true. COVID hit, that was challenging. Um, I was pretty stressed, especially the first few months, trying to figure out how are we gonna navigate all of this. Our business is based on people coming in. Um, we don't make much revenue if there's nobody coming in to ride. Uh, so that was really challenging. And then the other aspect of it was how are we gonna care for all these horses if we're fully shut down and there's no income coming in. Um, so we worked really hard. Some of our team were so kind to actually just come in and volunteer and help us out. And we made through it. You know, we got through it. It's been uh, hard and a lot of work, but um, it's also shown us how resilient we can be. So I'm, I'm happy with how we're coming out of COVID. Hopefully this is, you know, we're nearing the end of all the shutdowns, um, but we've, you know, survived it and, and now we're starting to thrive again, which is great. So we have a great team. We have about 14 coaches and then we have all our regular barn staff. We have our maintenance manager and crew. And if it weren't for them, we wouldn't be able to do this. It takes a huge amount of people. And then we also have a volunteer program. The volunteer program, it helps with us, especially with our beginner program. So they help with tacking up the horses and caring for the horses when we're really busy. And then they also get to gain some work experience. We take co-op students on. Um, we're quite a busy and vibrant place and it takes a lot of people to make it work. Even through to behind the scenes from our accountants, my family, who are always stepping in to help out. Um, it's, it takes a small village. Icon. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Joining us now to talk about the life and career of Eugene Melnick, the owner of the Ottawa Senators, who has passed away at the age of 62. We're joined by Wayne Scanlon, longtime hockey columnist in this city, covers the Ottawa Senators for Sportsnet.ca. Good morning, Wayne. Good morning, Rob. What was your reaction when you heard the news? Well, pretty shocked. I mean, I'd, uh, I'd heard, like others had, that, um, you know, Eugene Melnick wasn't uh, doing too well health-wise, but, uh, you know, you never know how these things will go, and uh, I think, like a lot of people, was uh, pretty stunned late last night to hear the news. Yeah, 62 years old. Wow, very young, very young, you know, when you think about it, 62 years old. Very young. Yeah. I know he went. He went to high school actually with a friend of mine in Toronto at St. Mike's, and uh, you know I think of him, the fellow that's a friend of mine, is pretty young guy, and early 60s is just uh, is just way too young. You're right. Yeah. So let, let, let's think back to when Melnick just kind of first burst on the scene here in Ottawa. He was really touted as. Um, I mean, he was a savior for the team, uh, wouldn't you say, Wayne? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, he might as well have ridden in on a white horse the way he was perceived. I mean, uh, there were a lot of people that were willing, uh, going all the way back to Bruce Firestone and Cyril Leader and that group, um, and Rod Bryden. They, they, they tried very hard to to run a you know a first class operation here and you know at the time that Mr. Melnick came in the Senators were arguably the best team in the National Hockey League they were right up there in that, that elite group 
but off the ice, you know, they, they carried a lot of debt from uh, from the arena, and uh, you know, getting that uh, getting that built in 1996. And um, this guy came in, you know, just so as you say, well touted, uh, the chairman and founder of BioVail Corp, a, a massive pharmaceutical company, he had deep pockets, um, he had roots in in Toronto, not Ottawa, but. Um, but in hockey, was, in, in hockey, yep, and it was yep. you know kind of. In, I can remember, like I can almost like it was yesterday, the opening press conference, and he talked about quite passionately about how it bothered him that uh, you know the city of Quebec lost its team and and had to move to Denver, and um, that, that drove him crazy. He just didn't think that was right, and that's what motivated him to step in in Ottawa and. and and buy the team and so um that happened you know he, he made overtures to buy the leafs and i always thought it was kind of interesting that uh he, he couldn't get the leafs and so he got their chief rival in ontario and uh went to battle with them and of course was yeah. was visibly upset when they lost to toronto in 2004 and that, that great playoff series and uh that resulted in him firing Jacques Martin, and Brian Murray came in, and of course had a had a long and uh, glorious relationship. Those two, uh, you know, Brian Murray as coach and GM, and from the hockey side, things have been pretty stable. And then on the business side, of course, things were you know a, a little less stable, and um, you know it's it's been kind of a complicated history between him and the fans of of Ottawa. But it's been a you know that's a long 19 year run. And, you know, for most of those 19 years, the Senators iced a pretty competitive team. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when, when I think back to those days, you, you know, the, there was the capital cost of just getting the arena built um, out there. And the reason why it's out there kind of has a complicated backstory in and of itself. But then there was also they had to build the overpass. Right, right. I had, to build, had to build the overpass uh, to get it there, and the and it, back in those days, the currency was a real drag on all the Canadian NHL teams because it was in it was in the '60s. So um, they had a lot of they had a, they had a lot of you know a lot of things going against them. It's amazing, really, back in those days to think about it that they were com- as competitive as they were. No, yeah, you know, you uh, raised some. Yeah. Uh, some great points and, and bring up conjure up some memories because I, I can remember Rod Bryden saying, "If we could have just like a seventy-seven dollar, I think <laughs> I think we could do okay. We could maybe break even." And yeah. you know, now of course we get up, we get upset if our dollar still gets in below eighty-eight cents or whatever. You know, and there's there have been times when our dollar's been worth more than the U.S. But of course, the the basic premise is uh, Canadian teams they take in their revenues in Canadian dollars and have to pay the players and uh, and and that's of course the biggest cost of all their their U.S. salaries. So, yeah, uh, yeah it, it it was a miracle, and you know for the most part it's been it's been fairly smooth. I'd say it got a little rockier over the the last ten years or so with Mr. Melnick musing that perhaps he needed to move the team. This is the guy that again was so fiercely determined to to keep Ottawa right yeah. here in the nation's capital and, and win a Stanley Cup with the Senators, but he got he got frustrated. And Why do you think he said things like that, Wayne? I, I don't that, know. I just I don't think he could kind of help himself, that uh, he just had a had a way of, of saying saying stuff that, that made headlines, and he didn't, he, he often didn't meet with Ottawa media. I know he had a close relationship with, with Bruce Garriock over at the, uh, the Ottawa Sun, but um, for the most part, didn't meet here. He did a lot of his talking from Toronto. You know, he'd uh, he'd go on uh, a, a Sportsnet station, a Roger station in in, in Toronto, and, and talk to people down there, and and then it would make a headline up here. But um, you know, like I, I do think his heart was was in the right place, and he certainly listened to Brian Murray. I think when when Brian Murray was was GM, he had a way of kind of working with Eugene and maybe calming him down if he would. I, I think there was a time when Eugene Melnick would just you know, react so, he, he was a fan, you know, yeah, and, and I think yeah. that was maybe the real, at the heart of it, and the, the issue that he had was that 
you know, fans aren't always the most rational human beings. You no, know, it's short no. for fanatic. And so it's it's probably easier if you're a guy with a whole lot of money that wants to keep a team but isn't all that attached to it in terms of the, the wins and the losses and all of that. I think individual wins and losses drove them crazy. And why can't we get a better goaltender? And, and I think Brian Murray just had a way of calming Eugene Melnick down. And that's why I think it works so well. And it was it was a little bit more difficult uh, after Brian, you know, passed a few years ago. Yeah, yeah. And you know, people wonder, you know, what you know what what happened with the relationship with Alfredson, and why isn't Alfredson, you know, part of the part of the front office group? What's history there? Um, when it comes to the fans and the complicated relationship with with ownership, I've I've always said, well, that's actually a great pro sports tradition. Uh, you know, nobody can spend the owner's money better than the fans. Right? <laughs> so, um, and there is, a, you know, in some markets, there is a tradition where the fans really don't like the owners. So, um, you know, certainly Ottawa was was not unique. But I think the rebuild w- was really. I mean, it's five years now without being in the playoffs since that unexpected magical run of 2017. So, um, you know, the fans are maybe be- they were becoming impatient, right, with the rebuild. So, yeah, 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 no, yeah. I think so. And, and I think some frustration, too, at a almost at a, at a deeper level with how the franchise was being run. I think, the, you know, when they saw serial leader leave and chief executives would come and go almost on an annual basis and yeah. chief financial officers. And then, you know, there's this idea that the, the team had to be closer to downtown. We're going to build in the Breton Flats. And then that all fell apart. And, you know, so that kind of landed at his, at his feet as well. And I think fans grew worried that, like, they, you know, Mr. Mellick himself had said, we have to move downtown, we have to be more central. And then when that fell apart and, and him and Trinity traded lawsuits and, you know, that, that, you know, that bridge just got burned. And then he had, he had to say, well, we're going to retrench and go back to Canada and make it a success out there. It was just very difficult for people yeah, to kind of vol- wrap- It was volatile. It, it was, was very volatile. Yeah, yeah, it was volatile. Okay, um... When something like this happens in professional sports, when the owner of the club passes away, what typically happens to the club? Well, you know, that's going to be interesting because he has always said that he's going to keep it in his family. He has uh, two young daughters. You know, they're not any older than 20 years old, so they're they're very young to be owning an NHL team. But I think at the very least... He's going, you know, he wanted to protect the equity in this franchise. A lot of his wealth right now, you know, he's not the... He's not the pharmaceutical giant anymore, and a lot of his his money, I think, is tied up in the in this team. And as you know, hockey teams are running for the six hundred and seven hundred million dollar range. So, at the very least, I think he wants to make sure that the equity is protected and that his daughters, you know, will oversee that. He does have a board of directors that kind of you know can oversee the operation for a while. Perhaps the NHL will get involved if the you know if the daughters wanted to sell the team or. Perhaps they want to remain um, part of the ownership group, and, and that you know somebody else comes in to, to kind of manage the operation. Uh, you know, it's we're just uh, we're just hours after his passing here, so this is all stuff that we're going to have to you know find out more about. But you know, it could go in many different directions. But uh, you know, he has said he definitely wanted to keep it in his family, so all right. that's that's going to be part of uh, you know the first step going forward. Okay. Thank you, Wayne Scanlon, for this morning. Greatly appreciate it. Thanks, Rob. Yep, from sportsnet.ca, Wayne Scanlon. From Carleton University, the professor in his weekly appearance right after the news on City News.
in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Tuesday, March 29th. Good morning, I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa, minus 8 degrees. It's minus 7 in Smith Falls, and here's what's making news of this hour. Senators are scheduled for a game tonight in Nashville, playing with heavy hearts following the death of owner Eugene Melnick last night. Ottawa Mayor Jim Watson tweeting, while we didn't always see eye to eye on some issues, I was always appreciative that Mr. Melnick stepped forward to keep the team in Ottawa, solidifying the organization's place as an integral part of our city. Longtime sports writer Wayne Scanlon tells the Rob Snow Show, Melnick was a savior of the team when he bought the club. He also described Melnick as a fan. Sometimes fans can be irrational. But it was people like Brian Murray who had a way to calm Melnick down, leading to some pretty good success. Environment Minister Stephen Gilbo says a new greenhouse gas emission plan he's going to table in Parliament this morning includes a roadmap to actually meet targets. Canada has issued at least 11 plans and set nine different emission targets. That was since 1988. Not one of them has ever been met. Driving at 110 will be the limit on six stretches of the 400 series highways very soon. Transportation Minister Caroline Mulrooney will announce a date today of April 22nd, ending the pilot project on six sections. That includes the 110 limit on the 417 between Ottawa and Quebec, Canada and Armprior. City News Time at 9.33. I'm Andrew Boyle. For news anytime, follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. Strong voice. Strong opinions. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. He is the poor professor from the Glebe. Where there are no potholes. There are no potholes in the Glebe. The, the streets are paved with gold and lined with money trees. Where Ian Lee lives. Uh, <laughs> Sprott School of Business at Carleton University. Good morning. Good morning. No, it's not true. We like, all you do is you just pick up the phone, and that's it. It's like, like you have a whole city crew down there, and they patch it right away. For if, you. if it was uh, only uh, true. Remember, we couldn't even get the snow removed from the snow banks, you know. They just push, go down the middle and push it to both sides so that only one car can go by. So, no, we don't get priority service. I, I don't agree with that. Priority At least service. not okay. in the in the poor area. Probably over on the high avenues where the most privileged people are, you know, where they have private oh, gated Clemo communities. Clemo and those Avenue. places, yeah. Powell, but not and, not where the regular. Actually, folks are. it's in the newspaper today that Powell is one of the top uh, streets in Ottawa for complaints about potholes. In pa- is Powell Avenue? So Isn't that? Uh, funny? Yeah, that is something. It okay, because they um, were the ones who tried to gate themselves. They took it down eventually. I think because you and I talked about well, it. Well, because you blew it. the whistle on them. You blew the yeah, whistle. Yeah, them. and I think yeah. they became so embarrassed that they were trying to give themselves privileges of saying, you know, city taxpayers pay for this, but right. nobody else can drive on our street except us. And uh, is this so egregious? Yeah. Oh yeah. And, like and what next? Well, you're going to put up down. your own little toll road there on Powell <laughs> Avenue. But, you know. anyway, anyway, I am pleased to report, uh, good listeners, that the um, the oil futures contract has. Just just dropped below a hundred dollars yeah. a barrel. It's at yeah. ninety nine fifty right now, U.S. a barrel. Um, so that's I, you know I'm I am pleased to see that. But nevertheless, let's. I want to start with the Conservative Party's leadership race because uh, you emailed me yesterday and you said, I think uh, Rob, I think Pierre Polyev is having a pretty good week. So why don't we start right there? Sure. Why do you say that? And, and let me qualify, uh, you know, sometimes one speaks too quickly. I had finished reading his um, policy proposals about banning oil from dictatorship countries that are run by dictatorships, right. obviously right. talking Russia and Saudi Arabia yeah. and similar countries, yeah. Venezuela, if we bring any in from there. Mm-hmm. But it's just a blanket. He just meant whether we bring it in or not, a blanket a ban on that. And I have no problem with that. I think that's a good idea. Okay. And and then uh, secondly, um, uh, increasing the output dramatically. I think he said a threefold increase out of uh, off of Newfoundland and Labrador, which I believe is Hibernia. And again, I think that's an excellent idea because uh, first off, we should be talking about this because we should be talking about how we're going to help uh, Europe uh, get off of the oil and gas that is fueling uh, that murderous um, gangster 
uh, a running Russia called uh, Putin, mm. and we, I believe, have a, a, a huge uh, duty to help, along with other countries, to Europe to get off that oil and gas, which is, as I said, providing the cash flow for Putin to commit his murderous atrocities in the Ukraine. And and so I thought, hey, you know, now you're finally talking policy. You're, you're no longer throwing mud at, a, at your fellow conservatives. Now you're talking about ideas and policy proposals. It's a good one. So I thought, hey, you're not having a bad week. And then after I sent you the email, I then read about his proposal for Bitcoin mm-hmm. and uh, his attack on the Bank of Canada. And, right. and I just... And that's where you think it... Meh, it like, that's off off-putting the, to you, right? That's off-putting to you. It's right? off-putting. It went off the rails a bit because... Okay. Uh, quite a bit. <laughs> quite because, a bit. Because, okay. I mean, I think that the... I believe that the Bank of Canada um, is respected. I didn't say it's loved. And there's a big dis- distinction between uh, loved and respected. Uh, I think the Bank of Canada is highly respected as extremely competent, mm-hmm. highly trained, skilled people there. Yeah. And... Um, and so he's suggesting things that I don't think, you know, that they're somehow in cahoots or something uh, with the government. And and I just don't think that that's the way to go. I believe I'm not trying to suggest you can't talk about certain he things. He suggests I'll, they're debasing the currency. They're going to yeah, debase the currency. There's a legitimate grounds to cr- uh, criticize monetary policy or fiscal policy. I have been criticizing professionally, I think, um, respectfully, re- criticizing the bank had for their. Um, unwillingness to recognize that inflation was becoming embedded. They kept saying, don't worry, don't worry, it's transitory, it's temporary. Yeah. And I said, eh, 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 hang on, it ain't, it ain't looking that transitory to me and to millions of Canadians. And I think for too long, and that's, I think, a fair criticism. They they were too slow on the uh, to react. And they allowed, and then Christia Freeland was pouring gazillions onto the fire uh, of the inflationary fire through the huge amounts of, of COVID support long after all the jobs have been recovered. And I said, all we're doing is, is encourage, giving huge amounts of money to people they can't even spend, which is why the savings rate went through the roof to the highest level ever in Canadian history. These are the sorts of things that I want Pierre Polyev to talk about. These are legitimate, not because I'm saying it, these are legitimate criticisms. These are legitimate arguments instead of going off into, you know, sort of into a, a, a dark corner of the, of the policy world and suggesting that, you know, somehow the, uh, uh, you know, the Bank of Canada is, is in cahoots with uh, bad forces. I, I just, I, he has, if he's going to win, he's got to move to the center a little bit. I'm not saying he's got to become a liberal, but he can't be adopting policies yeah. that are going to be seen and characterized by many in the media and other and uh, uh, other parties as, as uh, you know. Fringe, fringe. Uh, fringe. Yeah, yeah fringe. trying to, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I don't think that's the way to get elected. He may get elected as the leader of the party, but he's he's got to think about the bigger picture, which is can he appeal to a significant number? He's got to get to 40%. Yeah, you know, people say, lots of people tell me all the time, don't you understand? There's lots of people who never vote for him. That's not the point. Mm-hmm. Nobody gets elected with 100% or 80%. Pierre Trudeau, I looked up the numbers, yeah. and I'm talking percentage of the popular vote, mm-hmm. never broke 44%. Now, 44 is pretty damn good, let's be clear. Yeah. But he never hit 50 50. In fact, only one prime minister in the history of our country since three-way, four-way splits yeah. has ever hit 50, and it was Brian Mulroney, 1984. Mm. So you don't it's gonna have be to hard. It's going to be hard, I think, for, you know, if you consider the conservatives and the liberals to be the big tent parties, and then, you know, you have the New Democrats and the Bloc and the PPC yeah. and the Greens. I mean, it's going to be hard for any party to get 40. No, but you know, they're, the conservatives base, because you look at the polls, and yeah. they're somewhere around 32, 33, no. rock hard core. Yeah, 30, and so yeah. people say, how can he possibly become prime minister or any conservative leader? Well, you're basically at 33, if you assume it's 33, and maybe some people disagree, let's say it's 32. Right. Harper got elected with 38. And and so did Kretchen. And so my point is, basically 38 is the floor, notwithstanding the last election, which was a, an anomaly, I think, where Trudeau got in with 31. Let's set that aside as an outlier, a statistical outlier. I think 38 is pretty well the baseline from the last 30, 40, 50, well, 50, 60 years. So you got to get to 38. So if you got 32, this is simple arithmetic. The difference between 32 and 38 is 6%. Okay. He doesn't need... 50% of voters that have never voted. He needs 6% for 
from the liberal blue wing of the liberal party the the pro business liberals the the more rural business the liberals i mean liberals out in the rural and the suburbs and i think that he could if he was uh, you know created a centrist campaign that appealed to people in the burbs he could uh, get another 6% to get him up to 38 which will make him prime minister all right Ig- all right all ignore right. the downtown ignore the urban core because sure the glebes and the the glebes and the rosedales and the beaches and the town of Mount Royals and et cetera, they're never going to, they're always going to be like 70% NDP liberal. But out in the suburbs, I think he can pick up another 6% or whoever becomes the leader of the Conservative Party. Okay. All right. Um, the carbon tax is going up on Friday. And this is happening as the Trudeau government prepares just this very day to reveal its new greenhouse gas emissions targets. Now, this is a great Canadian tradition, setting targets. Meeting them is another thing. Um, but the, the, the new target is going to be we are going to cut greenhouse gas emissions in Canada in the next eight years by 45 percent. Now, how are they going to do that, Professor? I don't believe they can. You don't and believe I, they can? You think it's unachievable? I think it's unachievable. And, and that's not because they're bad people. Let's be very clear. I'm not even though I don't respect Mr. Gibo. Right. You know, he didn't do a personal home invasion of the Premier of Alberta, which I thought was illegal right. and wrong and immoral. But yeah. let's set that aside. Let's set that aside. Let's forget over that. Okay. He, it's not achievable in the following sense. When you look at the, and I have, I study the data as opposed to what politicians pontificate and bloviate over. Right. Um, when you look at the Natural Resources Canada prepared by the professional public servants there or the U.S. Department of Energy, and their energy forecasts, which they provide, you staffed by excellent public servants, energy economists, and so forth, or for those who say, I don't like either of those sources, then go to the U.N. agency called the International Energy Authority and look at their long-range forecast, because all three of those agencies produce long-range forecasts up to 2050. And every one of them, and they're completely, they're all pro-green, these three agencies. They're all saying, we got to go green, we got to go green. They're all forecasting that we are still going to be majority dependent on uh, oil and natural gas right through to 2050. So, and they're doing that based on looking at demand, GDP growth, uh, alternatives uh, that are being developed, nuclear, wind, solar, etc. So these are, they're not just picking numbers out of the sky. Right. They're doing deep dive, deep data, or, you know, huge macro uh, models of the economies of these respective, well, one's the world, one's the U.S., one's Canada. And all of these energy professionals, and there are thousands and thousands of them, are saying we're going to be majority dependent on oil and gas until uh, well into the uh, past 2050. Then the politicians come along and say, oh, no, 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 no. we're going to have a 50% reduction. And that brings me into my point that I've talked about before with you uh, uh, is is that the grid and the, um, the Canadian Electrical Association, which is all the provincial utilities across Canada, quietly say grid is simply not yet built up enough to deliver gargantuan amounts of a new level a new amounts of energy to displace the oil and gas we use and very quickly for those everybody listening 75 percent of the totality of energy consumed in this country is oil and natural gas people say what about electricity it's actually 20 percent of the totality of all energy used and this data is from natural resources canada the liberal government headed up by a liberal minister and and so my point is when you talk about a reduction of half you're talking basically cutting yeah. oil and gas consumption usage in canada in half in eight years in eight years remember yeah. I like to re- remind this to uh, to greenies. Every hospital, to my knowledge, in this country, every public school, or just about, yeah. and every university office and high-rise building and low-rise building. Natural gas. Heated by natural gas. Yeah. So are we going to pull the plug, and not to mention of the 60% of homes in Canada, starting with mine, full disclosure, yeah. Uh, are we going to go and tell all those Canadians, by the way, you, can't, you just can't heat your home anymore. So then they say, oh, don't worry, you'll just you know, convert to electricity. Well, I've got the studies from the city of San Francisco, which is a very, very left-wing progressive city that wants to get rid of all oil and gas, and they estimated the cost to retrofit a a house, a single-family home as opposed to a high-rise, is anywhere from 15,000 U.S. to 40,000 U.S. Now, that's the real... Well, I took a call from a caller the other day who's been, he's in the middle of this process right now, getting a heat pump, getting electric furnace, um, you know, going, electrifying his house. Yes. 
Yes. And he's up to almost sixty thousand dollars now. It's it's one of these, and I've had some debates recently, not not late, not recently. I mean, a couple of years ago or so, with Elizabeth May by email, and you know, I'm just stunned at the naivete, and, and she's a good person. But I'm stunned at the naivete. <laughs> right. They say, look, you just go and flick a switch. You know, yeah. You, just, yeah. you just stop using natural gas, flick a switch, implying that there's gargantuan amounts of unused capacity in the system, and there isn't. Right. Okay. If they, yeah. All you have to do is look at Ontario on a hot day in the summer where they're running. They're running the thing full out, full out. And they're, you know, they're just not that far sure. away from brownouts. We're no, we don't have uh, that kind of capacity, spare capacity, in Canada to disconnect half and stop using half of all the oil and gas. We okay. don't have the right. right. hydro right. 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 lines, and we don't have the nuclear power plants or yeah. the not solar gonna or wind implants. Not going to happen. Whatever target they announced today is not going to happen anyway. Okay. All right. When we come back, I want to talk about military procurement. Okay. 88, 88 F-35s are soon going to be ordered by a government that said we're never going to buy the F-35. That's coming right up with uh, Professor Ian Lee, Sprott School of Business, Carleton University, here on the Rob Snow Show on City News. So the Women's Business Network is um, a volunteer-run association that achieves its, uh, its uh, strategy and vision by supporting women to achieve their success on their own terms by providing development opportunities, valuable connections within the organization itself, and it, it facilitates member access um, to growth within their business and careers. I mentioned the absence, the two-year absence of the uh, Businesswoman of the Year Awards. Uh, you know, obviously difficult, Mira, but certainly an opportunity to, to work on some new things. Tell us what, what, you've, what you've got planned, what you worked on. Yeah, we really missed putting on the BYAs uh, for the last two years because of COVID. It, it also was unfortunate that we couldn't celebrate the women that were having such a huge impact on our um, community in Ottawa. So we're really glad that they're back now. Um, as you know, that they've been around since 1983. Mm -hmm. They are uh, a purpose to celebrate the achievements, the professional expertise, and the leadership of all of the outstanding women we have in the National Capital Region. And for the first time this year in 2022, we've introduced two new categories, one being the Lifetime Achievement Award and the other one being the, uh, the Community Champion Award. Okay, yeah, and let, let's break it down even further because, uh, as I mentioned, there's a there, there's different categories, and then of course different awards within categories. Uh, tell us about some of the returning categories and some of the other awards as well. So the two returning categories that we're bringing back are actually the entrepreneur and the enterprise leaders. Those are, are very popular in our community. They draw a, a significant amount of nominations um, and, and they do get a lot of attention because it's very common um, that we take the opportunity that we want to celebrate the entrepreneurs in our community, especially after the two years yeah. of being through what they've been through. No right. So we're, we're looking for nominees of, um, of owners who have significant impact on their businesses that have seen strong growth in the last little while. Um, and uh, one of the things that we did do to revamp this award was we dissected it into three subcategories based on the term that the individuals have been in business for. So you've got from startups that have been around for one to three years, then we've got the emerging entrepreneurs three to seven and the established entrepreneurs for seven years and above. So there's really going to be three, cat three awards or three uh, winners um, within the entrepreneur category itself. And then we've got the Enterprise Leader Award that's also come back. And this is an opportunity for organizations to nominate individuals within their, um, well, their, their, their business uh, um, that display exceptional leadership attributes, positively impact the environment. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News, 101.1 FM and 1310 AM. We're back with Professor Ian Lee, Broad School of Business at Carleton University with us every Tuesday morning. So there is a lot of pressure for Canada to increase its uh, military spending so that the country is closer to the 2% uh, of GDP target that is uh, preferred by NATO as a benchmark 
So it was revealed yesterday we are going to spend $19 billion on 88 F-35s, some 12 years on, but nevertheless, uh, it will be done. Uh, the shipbuilding program, I mean, just read the stories from David Pugliese and the Citizen about how that program is, is going. It's massively over budget and has really not been very good at actually delivering ships. It's more like a never-ending jobs program for the shipyard in Halifax. But um, procurement problems with the military have been well documented in this country. So what would really change if we increased defense spending by $16 billion a year? What what good it would would it do really i guess would be my question if procurement has proven to be such a challenge how would you uh, how do you look at that uh, Professor? i agree with you i wrote an op-ed um i i think it was eight or nine years ago uh, i believe it was published in the citizen and i wrote it with general ken penny who was the former uh, chief of the Canadian Air Force okay. in the early for early years of the uh, first of this uh, 2000? I think it was from 2003 to 2005. And we argue, uh, and I read the you know the big picture stuff. I didn't go into the weeds, but I read the big picture stuff because there were some really nice comparisons out about the three different, three or four different options or jets. And we recommended the F-35. And and it wasn't very bold, I don't think, because guess who has adopted uh, then and now the F-35? Well, the U.S. Pentagon, the military, and it's the most widely adopted fighter aircraft in the world. And so I was arguing, or we were arguing, or I was, uh, that the here are the liberals um, claiming that they, because they rejected it for many, many years, mm -hmm. uh, arguing that they knew way more than the Pentagon, which I just think is preposterous nonsense. Uh, the idea that Justin Trudeau or the, anyone in the Liberal Party has a deeper understanding of the, the needs of um, military uh, jet aircraft than the, the gargantuan <laughs> numbers of people in the U.S. Pentagon and the U.S. military is just silly. It's just silly. Okay. And we should have done this. But to your question, I, I, yes, we should be increasing our defense spending because we've committed to it for literally 40, 50 years. It's been a, the goal. The commit, it's not a goal. It's a commitment that all the NATO members have made, and they've constantly violated it. Not just Canada. Germany violated it, and Italy, and France, and so forth. Now they find that the chickens are coming home to roost because of what Putin, with his illegal invasion of, of Ukraine. So they're now, in fact, the Germans are apparently going to shoot past 2%. They might even go to 2.5% of German GDP. It's the, it's the fourth largest country in the world. So, so I think well, there's no doubt we should. We should be careful. Uh, you know, doing our own, um, uh, providing to carry our, our weight, you're carrying saying. our weight in the yeah. world. Yeah. But yeah. your point is, uh, we've got to solve the procurement problem. And by the way, it's not that because we don't know how to buy things; it's because it's become horribly, horribly politicized. And so we've got to figure out some way to separate. Just as once upon a time, if you go way back in Canadian history, um, there was a lot of corruption in, uh, uh, you know, elections. You know, you could there were books written about how you could buy votes uh, with a bottle of booze uh, on election day, and then we cleaned it up. You know, we created Elections Canada uh, to run uh, impartial, non-partisan elections because the political parties used to run the election process in our country. If you go back far enough in time. So my point is, I think what we're going to have to, yes, we have a procurement agency, I understand, but we've got to create one that's arm's length, similar to, for example, the appointments protest, pro, uh, appointments to the process, to the uh, to judges, of judges to the Supreme Court, of the Superior Courts. So I think we're going to have to do something like that to take the politics out of it. And then basically this nonpartisan, non profit, not de arm's length from government, maybe distinguished retired um, uh, generals and admirals, and maybe some retired former leaders of political parties, uh, recommend um, to the government the following, and then the government decides yes or no, and then they introduce the funding for it. But we've got to get the politics out, because that's what's sabotaged uh, uh, the, the procurement process in Canada. I've talked to people in it over the years, and they said the politicians have their fingers just all over it, every step of the way. They're micromanaging. The, uh, whatever party's in office is micromanaging the process and trying to get credit for, of course, 
the spending in their ridings uh, sure. in their province. And yeah. so we've got to somehow get that that out of the process if we want to have a, uh, a rational... Like we're going to have a shipbuilding program, but some of the ships have to be built at this shipyard, and some of them have to be built yeah. there, and da 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 you know, yeah. And yeah. on it goes like that, right? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. All right, very interesting discussion this week. Uh, we'll wrap it up there. You can go and tour the potholes of Powell Avenue and enjoy the rest of your day. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very yeah, much, yeah. Rob. Uh, Professor Ian Lee, Sprout School of Business at Carleton University, with us every Tuesday morning. Uh, so, again, Talk Back Hour is coming up right after the news. We are going to talk about potholes and the condition of the roads. We're going to talk about the future of Wellington Street this morning with your help. Uh, which remains closed to traffic in the aftermath of the occupation of Ottawa and the truckers' protest. And these greenhouse gas emissions targets, I know the professor doesn't think much about them. Unachievable, he said. What about you? How are we going to cut greenhouse gas emissions by 45% in the next eight years? You have any ideas? I'd love to hear them on the Rob Snow Show Talk Back Hour on City News. It's a new season of the new Fly Fisher on Rogers TV. I love to make abundance boards. And why do I call them abundance boards? Because they're an abundance of all the things that you love together. There's no rhyme or reason. There's no rules. It's literally about taking a whole bunch of different ingredients and making them into something that you love, that you can snack on. Maybe curl up on the couch and uh, have a snack night. Charcuterie is all about a meat plate. And antipasti is all about a little bit of meat, a little bit of fruit, and a little bit of snack that you might have at the beginning of a meal, like an appetizer. I like to take all of these concepts and kind of mesh them together. It's kind of like a work of art because you're creating something delicious, but you're also creating something that looks super fancy, like from a gourmet style restaurant, but just using simple things you have. not just political with the people in parliament you got street politics you got business politics you got basketball politics and if you don't know how to navigate the systems you get left behind i did they thought i went crazy they thought i was dead i was but it's never too late to heal to rebuild to reinvent yourself present W13 10 a.m. in Ottawa and CJET 1011 FM in Smith Falls and the Valley. Number one for local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News now on 1011 FM and 1310 a.m. It's Tuesday, March 29th. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa, minus 8 degrees. It's minus 7 in Smith Falls. And here's what's making news in Ottawa and the Valley. Some positive news today out of the peace talks in Turkey between Ukraine and Russia. City News reports, I, uh, reporter Irene Preklet has the latest. Turkey's foreign minister says Russian and Ukrainian negotiators have reached a consensus and common understanding on some issues, adding that a meeting between the Russian and Ukrainian leaders was also on the agenda but did not give a time frame. Russia's deputy minister saying today that Moscow has decided to fundamentally cut back operations near the capital and Cherniv. Ukraine's military says it has noted withdrawals around the two cities. Irene Preklitz, City News. City News time at 10.01. After learning just hours ago of the death of team owner Eugene Melnick, the senators are on the ice tonight. They're in Nashville for an 8 o'clock puck drop against the Preds. Now, his death was announced last night 
by his family. Hockey writer Wayne Scanlon tells uh, the Rob Snow Show it's too early to think about the team ownership, but Eugene Melnick has always said he wanted to keep it in his family. Scanlon also points out one reason why Melnick had such a complicated relationship with the Ottawa fan base. For the most part, didn't meet here. He did a lot of his talking from Toronto, you know, he'd... Uh He'd go on uh, a Sportsnet station, a Roger station in in, in Toronto, and, and talk to people down there, and and then it would make a headline up here. But um, you know, like I, I do think his heart was was in the right place. Melnick was 62 years old. City News Time 1002, and now your forecast with meteorologist Jill Taylor. Well, we're okay for today with sun and cloud, the high near zero, but we're already under a special weather statement for Wednesday with snow, ice pellets, freezing rain possible Wednesday afternoon and Wednesday night. So heads up for that. For today, the high zero. And right now, minus eight in Ottawa, it's minus seven in Smith Falls. The province is seeking to recruit more nurses in underserved communities, permanently boost the pay of personal support workers, and maintain a stockpile of PPE. Measures are some of the items in what the province is calling a plan to stay open. It aims to ensure the province is better equipped to respond if there is another health crisis. The minister in charge, Christine Elliott, says while COVID-19 pandemic is not over, the province is in a place where it can use the lessons learned over the past couple of years to shore up the health system. Measures include a $3 an hour wage enhancement for PSWs that the government has been extending for a few months at the time since. 2020. NDP is taking credit for a pledge to ban the use of replacement workers during strikes or lockouts in federally regulated industries. It's part of the confidence and supply agreement with the federal government, the Liberals promising to introduce a bill now amending the Canada Labour Code by the end of next year. The royal family gathered at London's Westminster Abbey today remembering Prince Philip of the Abbey, marking the memorial service in honor of the Queen's late husband, who died nearly a year ago. His funeral at St. George's Chapel at Windsor was severely restricted due to the pandemic. So this gathering contained many of the elements left out last year, focusing on his devotion to duty. Walking the Queen in, Prince Andrew, just a few weeks after his out-of-court sexual abuse settlement, notably absent Harry and Meghan, who stayed in the States. Tom Rivers, ABC News, London. And I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. Talk back. Hello. On the Rob Snow Show. The phone lines are open at 613-750-1310. Now, the Rob Snow Show continues. Bag this morning. Kind of a mixed bag this morning for the Talk Back Hour. Okay. I want to talk about the roads. I want to talk about one road, Wellington Street, and I want to talk about climate change and greenhouse gas emissions. So it's a bit of a mixed bag. But just on the roads, okay? Are the roads of Ottawa actually getting worse? If you, if you drive around the city of Ottawa, are the, uh, the, how would you describe the condition of the roads in the city of Ottawa? I know it's pothole season. But nevertheless, are, are, are the roads actually getting worse? Okay, worse in recent years? Better, better than in recent years? Certainly spending a lot of money on the roads, according to the mayor, according to the city council. But I'm curious, your impressions, the, the motoring public, 750-1310, 750-1310, Wellington Street, what should happen with Wellington Street? Wellington Street remains closed to traffic uh, following the occupation, right? They closed it. Should it remain closed to traffic long term? Okay. Or should it be, you know, reopened? Go back to the way things were before the occupation. What's your opinion on that? And uh, the big story in federal politics will be the greenhouse gas emissions targets that will be announced today in Vancouver, British Columbia at an event featuring Mr. Trudeau. Mr. Guillebeau, the Environment Minister, and as well the uh, the Natural Resources Minister, Mr. Wilkinson. The government's new target for cutting greenhouse gas emissions in this country will be a reduction of 45% by the year 2030, just eight years from now, almost in half. And as soon as eight years from now, 
How do you think that will be achieved? 750 13 So, uh, the state of the roads, the future of one road, Wellington Street, and uh, on climate change, the new climate change plan is being unveiled by the federal government. And uh, if we're in a climate emergency, should we really be spending um, any money at all fixing up the roads? <laughs> what do you think? Um, yeah, the condition of the roads in Ottawa, David is convinced they are worse. Do you think the condition of the roads is getting worse? Or is it getting better over the years? I would like to know. Um, Gosh, I think as hard as 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 it is to believe, because they've been in pretty rough shape before, I actually think the roads in Ottawa are getting worse, Uh, which is an incredible accomplishment just given the money that the city spends on on trying to maintain the roads. (laughs) I don't know. Maybe it's fighting a losing battle. Um, I'm bringing this up today. Uh, there are a couple of items that jumped out at me in the newspaper uh, this morning. It's in the Sun, in the Ottawa Sun. Also, in the one of the stories is in the Citizen. I don't think Kelly Egan's column is in the Citizen this morning. Uh, but there's uh, some reporting by Bruce Deachman in the Citizen and the Sun this morning. It's about potholes. Lots of complaints about potholes. And no wonder, lots of potholes to complain about. The city usually pins the blame for potholes uh, on the weather. <laughs> okay, not on, the, not on the road's budget, but uh, it's the weather's fault. Don't blame the city, blame the weather. You know, freeze-thaw weather, freeze-thaw weather, because that's the perfect weather for, for potholes. Um, if I've heard it once, I've heard that a million times. Bronson Avenue, described in the newspaper today as unforgiving. It is unforgiving because of potholes from one end to the other. Powell Avenue, as I mentioned um, with the professor, Alta Vista Drive. Gosh almighty, that place has always been bad, especially for the property taxes they they pay to live in a neighborhood like Alta Vista. You would think that the the streets would be paved with gold in Alta Vista. Uh, Kilbourne Avenue, Bay Street, Somerset Street, I can attest, uh, Somerset Street. Um... Just the condition of the roads in Ottawa. Better, worse, spend a lot of money on roads in this city, building new roads, repairing roads, digging up roads. A lot of money. Uh, Emissions, to be announced, a new target today, 45% cut in just eight years. And Wellington Street, long term. What should happen to it with Wellington Street? So let's get to some calls here. In Manatic, Doug... Morning, Doug. Yes. Hi, Doug. Yes, uh, calling about the roads. Calling about the roads, okay. Yeah. Are they actually getting worse, Doug? Uh, uh, it's brutal. brutal. When okay. I drive, all, I'm driving all over the place. Once you get off the 416 or the Queensway, I think you need an off-road vehicle. <laughs> yeah, they're that bad. They're that well, bad, okay. And they're crying, crying. Watson is crying for everybody to go downtown. Watch to bring people in. Well, there isn't a decent road to get into the city. <laughs> okay, okay. And is this is it just this time of year? You know, pothole season. They say it's pothole season, or is it kind of an all year round thing for you? Doug? It's an all year round. An all year oh, round it, thing. Okay. Like you take uh, oh, it's regional roads. It was a regional <laughs> road six there, uh, Roger Stevens to Smith Falls. Yes. Okay. It's brutal. Just brutal. Uh, Bankfield is brutal from the highway down to Prince of Wales. You get on Prince of Wales, and it's brutal. (laughs) Oh. All right. All right. It's pathetic. Pathetic. I think they're taking all the money, saving the money, and putting it into that glorified streetcar. Well, well, that... There, that you know, that's been alleged in the past, Doug. You're yeah. not the fir- you're not the first to allege that. I I will give you that. Um, yeah. The mayor says, "Look, we're spending big bucks on the roads." Um, that he's a pro roads mayor and he has a pro roads council, the majority of the council. Most recent budget, you could make the case maybe that it was a roads budget. Let me give you some of the highlights, okay? Okay, $88 million to improve and renew roadways, including $76 million for resurfacing. $62 million for major road construction projects, including 
widening the Findlay Creek area of Bank Street. I believe that's the far south end of, of Bank Street, right? Building an Earl Grey underpass and a roundabout on Palladium Drive. Ooh, a roundabout for Palladium Drive. How exciting is that? I'm guessing that's near the Palladium. Right? What we now call Canadian Tire Center, I'm guessing. That'd be Palladium Drive. It's got to be at like Huntmar and Palladium at the highway there. Right. Oh, another roundabout just with the city. That would actually be good. I think that would work. I like the roundabouts. I hate roundabouts. Oh, you don't like them, eh? $48 million for integrated sewer and road work. Hey, let's dig up the road and replace the sewer at the same time. Now, let, let's not do those, those separately anymore, right? And for uh, people in the rural parts of Ottawa, a grand total of $4.4 million for rural road upgrades and guardrails. Uh, let me tell you, $4 million, you do not get a lot of road for $4 million. Uh, Brendan, Blackburn Hamlet. Brendan. Yes. How would uh, you do? You want to talk about the roads. Is that right? The roads in, Bla in Blackburn Hamlet and Innes Road are horrible. But they're horrible because of the lack of sloping and, and proper installation of, uh, you know, uh, the sub-base is wrong. Okay, okay, okay. And uh, and the uh, and the fencing and uh, anyway, I won't get into that. The other the other thing is they should they should use better topping, more flexible topping. Like a different kind be, of what? More, asphalt more or something? Are added to the uh, pavement that creates potholes in the spring. Okay, okay. Now okay. the other thing is I agree that Wellington should be shut down to traffic and... Permanently. Permanently. Okay, interesting. Yes, I agree okay. with that. And the other subject was the... Uh, greenhouse gas. Yeah. Well, greenhouse gas emissions, yeah. Greenhouse gas emissions, yeah. Now, um, the problem is that um, our Defense Department went cheap with Australian planes back when... But I think we should go with the F-35s because the infrastructure is already set there and the Swedish Saab would, re would require a complete infrastructure change. I see. Okay. Yeah, I'm not really talking about the F-35 right now, but I understand uh, your interest in that. 750-1310, 750-1310. I just find it remarkable, like from 2015, there were... You know, there was true. We will never buy the F-35. It's not the right plane. It's going to be a nightmare for Canada. And on and on. He went like that for the whole election campaign. They've wasted the last six years. You know, they went and bought the used AF-18s <laughs> from Australia, used fighter aircraft. And now here they are. Um, a global military crisis with this invasion of Ukraine, uh, you know, their hand, their hand has been forced, right? That need new fighter jets. And they're going to buy the ones they said they would never buy that were just not the right fit for, for Canada. Nevertheless, uh, Kevin in Ottawa, Kevin. How's it going? Hey, it goes, sir. Kevin. Yes. You want to talk about greenhouse gas emissions? Yeah. Kind of drives me nuts. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to say the company I worked for, uh, yeah. but in the probably the last 10 years, retrofitted a whole whack of the city of Ottawa buildings. Okay. To natural gas. Some oh, to natural from, gas. Like okay. some of them for oil, and we put them onto natural gas. Right, right. And because the city. Time, you know, the, yeah, I'm sorry, Kevin. The city post amalgamation it, it inherited a lot of older buildings from some of the outer municipalities that were still on like home heating fuel, basically like oil, right? And they converted yeah, them to I'm, natural. I'm, 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 yeah, converted them to natural gas. Yeah, I'm also talking some of the buildings off Ogilvy Road. Or, you know, oh, yeah, so okay. It's pretty, yeah, yeah it's, still in, it's still in town, you know what I mean? Like, why sure. Why did why natural gas, when we knew we were going to be putting them onto electric within a couple of years anyways? You know what I mean? Like, it's it just it just makes no sense. It, and the reason is, is because they can't generate enough heat out of the electric, electricity to keep the the arenas and stuff warm and, and to cool them and it yeah. just it just doesn't work well just how realistic is is it to do like it takes something for example take the oc I, transpo I'm bus a, garage take the oc guy, so. take the oc transpo bus garage on saint yeah. boulevard okay yeah that is one of the 
of all the municipal buildings, that's one of the the largest consumers of natural gas in the city among the city's sure. whole real sure. estate portfolio. You gonna what? How are you gonna heat that thing with electricity? It's impossible. Impossible. It's literally, right? It's literally, literally impossible. Unless you set it on fire, it's literally impossible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because you get those overhead doors that open up, you have such a heat loss. Yeah. There's no way. No way. The only way you can is with oil fired or gas fired uh, tube heaters or uni heaters, something like that. You're not going to get the recovery out of electricity. Yeah. Furthermore, we have half these buildings all flat roofs. You know what I mean? They're running around putting grass on it to make it look good. Why aren't we putting solar panels on them? Mm. Because it doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's, it, it's, yeah, it's, it's kind of crazy some of the things that we do, right? In this city. Well, yeah, it's, yeah. Just, it's just throwing good money on the bat. Yeah. Well, now, I it's mean, just, now that, you know, they're saying now that we're going to cut greenhouse gas emissions almost in half. Okay, not quite 45% in eight years. Does that sound realistic well, to you? It's, it's impossible. Impossible. Explain this yeah. to me, and I, I, I get into arguments with people all the time about it, especially these stupid windmills. That, that thing that you're putting up with the big windmill on it will mm-hmm. never generate enough hydro to recoup the footprint it took to build it, produce it, and put it up. Like, if you think of all the steel that's gone into it, the concrete that's gone into it, the machineries that have been used to dig the foundations and the platforms, run the wires, everything else, you're building a structure that will never in its lifetime recoup what it costs to build it. Yeah. Its lifetime is still about 20 years, too, from what I understand. Yeah, well, it never will. You mean it's impossible. Impossible. All right, Kevin, thank you. Very interesting points Kevin makes there. Okay, we'll be right back. Uh, Barry in Ottawa, Hussein, Bill, I'll take your call. we got a whole bunch of things going on. The state of the roads, what to do with Wellington Street, environmental policy. We're all over the place, and uh, we love it that way from time to time here on the Rob Snow Show on City News. crowd here tonight the Ottawa Civic Center the OHL championship game six two of the best face-off men in the OHL meeting right here at the Civic Center Zenit Kanopka against Steven Weiss and we're underway as John Zion grabs it gets across the blue light quick shot right on Zep no problem high off the glass back to center for Ottawa Sellers pass up to Bauman gets bumped off the puck Wisniewski, puck out to scores! The Ottawa 67s take a 1-0 lead. Brian Kilroy was talking earlier today that sometimes in big games it's a lucky bounce that can decide things. Was he ever right on this play so far? Watch Sozanov going the opposite way, just take a whack at it. Look at Talbot strip the puck from Oosternall. There it is in front of the net, and Sozanov gets a piece of it. And it goes in behind Rob Zepp. Bowman carries the puck up the ice. Then Talbot steps on And there's Sozanov, who outwins the assignment with the back-checking Damian Surma. And Ottawa's got the lead. John Zion for Ottawa. Up to Sozanov. His pass to Talbot. One man to beat. Talbot scores! Far side. Low on Rob Zepp. Power play goal for the Ottawa 67s. He is on fire tonight for the 67s. Look at the jump in his legs. Right here he explodes with the puck. Head up, shot, a goal scorer's goal from the captain, Mighty Joe. And the 67s now have a stranglehold on the Plymouth Whalers. 2-0. Nothing Zepp could do on that play. He just placed it perfectly. It had nowhere else to go. Just a beautiful goal scorer's goal from the captain. Tied up by two Whalers. Savage came in there, and here comes Plymouth. Three on two. Bernarski with Jarrett and Stewart. Centered in front. Scores! Preston Mitzi. Left alone in front. And Plymouth climbs to within one. Picked off by Jarrett. Centered in front. Ottawa can't get a rope. Bounce off the leg. Whalers. Championship. There's Brian Kilray. 
away. Zenon Kanopka handing him the cup. On the Rob Snow Show. Have your say and call now. 613-750-1310. Describe the condition of Ottawa's roads. Are they actually getting worse? Are they getting any better? What's your what's your sense there? Okay. That could almost be an annual tradition here on the Rob Snow Show, talking about the uh, the state of the roads during pothole season. The this you know the city maintains the city council maintains we're going to spend a lot of money on the roads. Um, and you look at the budget, you know, seventy six million dollars worth of worth of road paving. Uh, I you know you, even because this is. Um, an election year, and you have some downtown councillors who would never say anything about the state of the roads other than we spend too much money trying to fix up the roads. Well, now some of them are running for mayor, so um, even they're starting to complain about the condition of the roads. What does that tell you about the condition of the roads? I do remember a time when the mayor of Ottawa, Jim Watson, told me that during his time, he admitted to me right on the radio that as mayor, he had neglected the roads because there was so much focus on light rail and getting light rail up and running that that came at the expense of maintaining the roads. And his office really started hearing about it. That was years ago. But that's one of the questions that I have for you today is, um, you know, are they better any better now? (laughs) Or could it be that the roads are actually getting worse? And, um, you know, if you have an example, it just kind of comes to mind. I'd love to hear it. Now, what to do about Wellington Street? That's another question. It's a question that's asked in uh, uh, Kelly Egan's column in the paper this morning, Post Media, um, where he says it would have major traffic implications if we closed uh, Wellington Street off to traffic permanently. That it's a, you know, you have a five lane east west route. Sparks is already a pedestrian mall. Queen Street is only two lanes. And um, he says this proposal for a tram between Ottawa and Gatineau, we are never going to see that in our lifetime, (laughs) which I kind of have that feeling as well. So what do you think should happen to to Wellington Street long term? Do you keep it open? Do you reopen it and treat it as, you know, just any other street in Ottawa? Or do you, as some are proposing, you you close it? Do you make it um, more... Pedestrian, cycle friendly, um, you know, put some public transit on it like a tramway or maybe bus only lanes and that's it, but no private vehicles. What do you think? What should happen to Wellington Street? What should happen to Wellington Street? Open, keep it closed. I'd love your I'd love an opinion on that. I see lots of people want to talk about the roads. Uh Barry in Ottawa. Good morning, you're on City News. Barry. Good morning, Rob. Yeah, hi Barry. As far as the OC Transpo garage. Uh, you can't keep the cows and the horses warm if you don't close the doors. Right. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, anyways, but on uh, the roads, Barry. On the roads. Yeah, how would you? How would you describe the roads? I mean. Oh, uh, uh, I don't think they're any better, Rob. After working in uh, paving and road construction for the last twenty years of my truck driving uh, right. career, uh, I don't think they've improved that much. Uh, you know, the, it's not like they don't uh, try and look after them. Like I know when they're paving them, the larger companies, uh, the city makes them draw samples out of the paving machine, and they bag up, uh, you know, like a good-sized bag of uh, asphalt and take it back to the paving company, to their lab, for that uh, to be marked and analyzed for content. I don't know if they're using too much sand or too much stone or if the asphalt oil or tar is not the quality that they should be using. Uh, they have all kinds of different mixes that they make for different conditions. But, right, uh, right, okay. I just uh, I think it's the way they put it down, and uh, also maybe there's not enough of something it should be put in there to give it better adhesion and make it stick together. The actual better. mix is not the appropriate mix, maybe, for the, yeah, the climate. But, uh, on, maybe. I know there's a lot of places where the road cracks all up and stuff like that, the plowing in the wintertime and the different fluctuations of temperature, I think, is really hard on the asphalt. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, 
Like, I know I see streets sometimes that I drive on, sometimes in the back roads to avoid the main roads and the potholes. And uh, so, like, there's some places where you can phone in the city and say, hey, the whole road is breaking up. <laughs> it's all full of cracks and oh, yeah, breaking yeah. up. It's small. They may not be really big, dangerous, deep potholes, but their roads are really rough. They're rough. You know, and those are the kind of roads that they have to go through. And uh, it's actually quite extensive. It's not as simple as just uh, taking a paving machine in there or, or, uh, or you know, like the, they call it a shave and pave with the uh, grinding machine to grind off the old asphalt and then put a new layer on top because they usually have to, because of the clay base we have around Ottawa, I think they are, you know usually have to have a road crew go in and they re-level all the sewer tops. They redo a lot of the sewer tops because the pounding that the sewer tops take from the buses and larger trucks and stuff like that, yeah. the, the cement collars eventually break down on the sewer tops. So they have to go in and redo all the sewer tops and adjust all them. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you do that. actually, Barry, I thank you for your call. You do actually think the, the, the roads are getting worse, which is kind of the, the crux of it here. Uh, Hussein, Ottawa. Hey, uh, hey Rob. Hey, uh, good to hear from you. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I wanted to know that they're spending $76 million, uh on fixing the road this year, right? It says road resurfacing, yeah, in the budget, yeah. Okay, and what happened to the last year's money? Because I thought we buy warranty for a year. Oh yeah, I'd have to. Yeah, I'd have to actually look that up. But uh, yeah. So we're spending uh, seventy six. Well, plus that's. The last yeah, I guess year. that's only if we're filling in the same pothole twice. Is saying. Right. Yeah. So you mean to say they're all brand new portals and oh, maybe I guess the so. amazing job that they do filling in doesn't come <laughs> back out once the cleaners go on top of it. Right. 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 Yeah. You do remember that auditor general's report that we talked yeah. about, right? Where he and, and I'm still yeah. trying to get that warranty. You know. Yeah. Every year. <laughs> yeah, okay. I somehow don't see it. Yeah. So. Okay. Uh, yeah. 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 There's a guy who's paying attention because I was in an auditor general's report from the city of Ottawa. Gosh, that must be five years ago now. Where the Auditor General for the City of Ottawa said, you know, when you buy, when you hire one of these private companies to do the potholes, fill in the potholes, they're supposed to give you a warranty for their work. And if the pothole reopens, they're supposed to come and, I don't know, fill it in for free, I guess. But he said that the, the city wasn't enforcing that warranty and that it was costing millions of dollars in the, in the course of a year. But we're talking about the roads. We're talking about the future of Wellington Street. And greenhouse gas emissions and that and a whole bunch of stuff this morning because it's the talk back hour on the Rob Stowe Show on City News. The Calgary Stampede is a world-renowned festival celebrating wrangling, bull riding, and everything cowboy. But did you know that many people credit its origins to a black Canadian? Take a minute to meet John Ware. The word cowboy has racist roots. Before the American Civil War, white ranchers were called cowhands, but the enslaved black men and women working alongside them were actually referred to as cowboys to infantilize and disrespect black ranchers. The legend of cowboy John Ware is full of impressive feats and awe-inspiring skill, including the ability to train even the wildest broncos and easily hold a horse on its back. But the real story of John Ware is one that starts from more humble beginnings. Ware was born into slavery in the United States, gaining his freedom towards the end of the American Civil War in 1865. Ware's skills with cattle ranching developed as he traveled throughout the United States, eventually settling in a town southwest of present-day Calgary, Alberta, which made him one of the first black pioneers in the prairies. Over time, news of Ware and his amazing cowboy skills began to spread, and people came from across North America to witness his horsemanship and skills as a rancher. Eventually, Ware went on to own many of his own ranches. In 1892, he became the first man in Western Canada to earn the title of steer wrestler, and Ware's feats in local contests set the stage for the Calgary Stampede Rodeo we know today. In September of 1905, Ware was killed in a freak accident with his horse, and more than 10,000 mourners from across the region attended his funeral, making it one of the largest in Alberta history. Though his true story is difficult to separate from the legends around him, Ware's status as a respected forefather of cowboy skill continues to be celebrated today. 
Ware has dedicated monuments across Alberta, including several sites near his first ranch, a Calgary school in his namesake, and a building at the Southern Alberta Institute of Technology. News in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Tuesday, March 29th. Good morning, I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa, minus 7 degrees, it's minus 6 in Smith's Falls. Here's what's making news this hour. Senators are back on the ice just hours after learning of the death of the team owner, Eugene Melnick. They're in Nashville tonight. It's an 8 o'clock puck drop. The Sens play one more on the road after tonight and then return to the Canadian Tire Centre for a Sunday afternoon game. They're playing Detroit at 1 o'clock. The Dutch government has expelled 21 Russian intelligence officers, saying their presence is a threat to national security. It comes as peace talks in Ukraine are said to be showing some positive signs. The deputy Russian defense minister says Moscow is cutting back its military operation near Kiev and Cherniev to, quote, increase mutual trust at the talks in Istanbul. It appears to be the first major concession the Russians have made since launching their invasion of Ukraine more than a month ago. The province is making moves to ensure the next health crisis will be handled better. It's called legislation, the plan to stay open. It will boost the pay of personal support workers, report annually on the state of the PPE supply in Ontario, and update the emergency plan at least every five years. City News Time, 1032. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. Talk back. Hello. On the Rob Snow Show. The phone lines are open at 613-750-1310. Now, the Rob Snow Show continues. So I just went back into my archives here, David, and found this. This is um, Ken Hughes was the Auditor General of Ottawa at the time. What year was this that this report came out? Let me check here. 2017. 2017. So what's that? Five years ago now. Five years ago. Does a big thing into uh, potholes. Potholes. Why are there so many potholes in the city of Ottawa? And it was part of um, a whole audit he did of that entire branch of the of the city government, the road services branch of the of the city government. And uh, it was Mr. Hughes, the auditor at the time, said in Ottawa, the Ottawa road crews repair. 150,000 potholes a year in the city of Ottawa. 150,000 a year. Okay? And um, many are done not by contractors, but also by city crews. And they're supposed to, if they're done by private contractors, they're supposed to guarantee the work for a year, for one year. And if they have to do... Uh, if it's a private company and they're doing a, like a longer stretch of road, what Barry called a shave and pave, where they actually like grate the road right down and resurface it, then that work is supposed to be warrantied for three years, according to the auditor. That's what the standard in the industry. But because we have to fill so many potholes, 150,000 potholes, there is no way <laughs> that you can, no feasible way uh, that you could actually ever enforce the warranty on 150,000 pothole repairs. So, yeah, would he have a big spreadsheet of all the potholes in the city, like a know. heat map of all the potholes? I don't know, but anyway, it's interesting. It, you know, it's kind of like a like an annual thing to talk about potholes in this city. But uh, the roads, the roads, I mean, they we're talking very basic infrastructure. People spend a lot of uh, their tax dollars. It's about 100, for every $1,000 in property tax you pay, about $150 goes to fixing and maintaining the roads. Okay. Uh, Bill in Vanier. Bill, good morning. You're on City News. Bill. Hey, hello. How's it going? Yes, hey, it's, uh, yeah. sorry, it's, uh, it's Phil, not Bill. Oh, Phil. Sorry. Phil, go oh, that's ahead. That's okay, that's okay. Yeah. Yes, the roads in Ottawa, well, I live in Vanier. I drive my kids to school every morning, and the roads are just getting worse and worse and worse. Like, I drive to, I drive the kids to school, and it's bump, bump, bump all the way. Like, going down Beechwood, and it's horrible. Then I have to go down uh, to Bank Street to go drop my other son off of school. Okay. And Carling, don't even get me started on Carling, because that's Carling. just a total disaster. <laughs> 
Uh, and then I drove up There early. was a time when I thought Carling Avenue was just going to, like, slowly slip right into Dow's Lake. Honest <laughs> to goodness. Uh, the yes, way that but, road was going for a while. Yeah, because yeah, uh, I, 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 I drove down Carling once, and I went, no, never again. So anytime I have to go anywhere near that area, I try and avoid it at all costs. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. yeah, and, yeah. and then Orleans, driving out to Orleans, that's, the, that's even getting worse, too. So, like, uh, I don't uh, see uh, the, the, what the mayor should have did. It was don't build the light rail because it's useless anyways. Right. It's always breaking right. down. Yeah. And, ta- oh. and take that money that for the lead rail, repair the roads, and everything would have been fine. Well, but, yeah, kind of a tough sell, I think, Phil. Yeah, but, I, uh, I hear you. yeah, yeah. But, never, but he did admit at one time we got too carried away on focusing on light rail, and that came at the expense of, of road maintenance. I, mean, yeah, I think they're making up for a lot, trying to make up for lost time, but, the, you know, they maybe they're fighting a losing battle now, Phil. Yeah, yeah, they are because, uh, see, because the roads get worse, and then it's taking more beatings on, on the vehicle because, like, my vehicle, my alignment goes out again, so then I have to get it realigned. My tires are, are going, so it's like, okay, it's like cost of the roads, repair yep. the vehicles. Yep, yep. Okay, Phil, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's, it is hundreds of thousands of dollars that the city pays out every year in damages. The number one reason somebody sues the city for property damage in the city of Ottawa is because uh, the pothole damaged their car. You know, ruined the wheel, whatever the case might be, and they try to seek remedy legally uh, by way of the city of Ottawa. Hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. City pays out. David in Ottawa. So, yes, David. Frog, yes. You're right. There's about 150,000 potholes. I've counted every one of them as I've hit them. <laughs> <laughs> just, just teasing. But listen, I want to yeah. talk about the, um, the, the Wellington. Wellington Street. Yeah, yes, it, yes, it should yes. be opened again. You should uh, be. Okay. Exactly. Um, first of all, there's deliveries of all kinds and work being done on how many buildings along that Wellington Strip on Parliament Hill? From, all of them? <laughs> all and then. Now, let me ask you this, do you think? Hmm. Do you think that if they leave Wellington blocked off that they're going to drive the minister's limousines along Albert Street and make them walk from there? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just drop them off at the Rideau Center. And yeah, let, let, let them, them take light. The yeah, the they, they, can, they can get the light rail the rest of the way. Yeah, no, leave, leave, put, get it open. But, uh, <laughs> you know, you don't have to let people go and park there with their trucks like they did before. Okay, uh, okay. But leave it open. It's, 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 it's the best way to handle traffic. And if we ever, ever, ever get that thing around the loop around, from Gatineau, that would be a really nice place for it. It'll really be the the icing on the cake for it. But you can't shut it down and get the buses running across Queen Street and everything else like that. It's just not working. All right. Okay. Thank you, David. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Wellington Street. That's also in the mix this morning. You know, in addition to your general impression of the of the roads in the city. You know, long term, Wellington Street. What should happen with Wellington Street, given what happened with the occupation, okay? The nearly month-long occupation of Ottawa. Wellington Street remains closed. And uh, there are some who think it should stay that way. There are some who think it should have been closed to vehicle traffic years ago. After the events of 9-11, it's about safety and security and national security, and there are just too many things, really bad things, that could go really, really wrong. Uh, I put that to Bob Shirelli yesterday when he was on the show because he's running for mayor and he's, he told me he's not in favor of uh, closing all vehicle traffic from Wellington Street, that the traffic would have to to go somewhere and, um, you know, look around. Where would it go? Where would it go? East-West. Joanne in Orleans. Good morning. You're on City News. Joanne. Morning. Hi. Morning. Hi. I, I uh, remember the report you were reading from uh I, I think it also talked about the quality of the asphalt that was used. Yes, it did. Yes, and it did. Um, yeah. that we didn't have enough inspectors, to, or it seemed like there was no one inspecting the quality, and therefore you couldn't hold up the guarantee. The complaint was that it was very expensive to test the asphalt because to send it to a lab costs $3,000 to test one sample. Yeah, yeah. And then what do we pay for for not doing that, right. correct? Right, yeah. So I, I'm just wondering out loud, you know, what if we had a mayoral candidate who actually uh, campaigned on the fact that, you know, we're going to go back to basics and roads are top of the list because we're getting ripped off. The taxpayer is getting ripped off. So we're going to hire inspectors and we're going to, 
you know, see if, if the application of the pavement, as one of your previous callers said, is it being done properly? Is the quality of the pavement proper? Let's follow the auditor, auditor general's advice. Like, would we say that candidate is angry because they're reading the room, because they're looking to resolve the visible frustration of the taxpayer? I, I'm using this as an example because I don't understand the refrain that people keep saying Polyev is angry. He's too angry. Oh, he's so angry. And I keep thinking, do people not know that Canadians are angry? They're frustrated. They're fed up. They feel powerless. Many, especially in the face of this liberal NDP alignment, uh, alliance, um, the roads are lousy. Anyone who taps into the frustration of the taxpayer to resolve that problem long term would be really doing themselves a favor, let alone the taxpayer favor. And that's the kind of thinking that we need, municipally, provincially, and federally. And I simply don't understand anyone who thinks that someone who under reads the room yeah. <laughs> would call a candidate angry. Yeah, for example, I mean, the, one of the accusations is he's, uh, Polyev is practicing the politics of grievance. He's, 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 he is um, taking people's grievances and he's feeding it back to them and that this is somehow either unique um, or dangerous, uh, uh, accusing a politician of practicing the politics uh, of grievance. What it, what it actually discounts, I think, <laughs> is that people might actually have grievances with their government. Exactly. Right, especially then, a government that's been there for six years, promised a lot of things, and has accomplished very little. And may I add that opposition leaders who haven't really been authentic and honest, uh, that they also have led to that grievance. Um, it, it, and it's not wrong to seek to fix it. Polyev seems to be the only one who's coming up with some real solutions to some real problems. And they're not overly complicated. Mm. But when you're not driven by an agenda where you have to make a square peg fit in a round hole, like paying more attention to uh, uh, climate change, for example, climate change isn't the reason the roads are like they are. I, I personally believe very much it's the quality of the asphalt and perhaps the way it's being applied but we've had climate we've had weather in ottawa forever it has not always been like this okay okay freeze thaw freeze thaw freeze thaw that's what they'll blame it on that's what they blame it on well you know freeze thaw freeze thaw and that's only become going to become more common as you know the climate change gets worse. You will hear that, Joanne. You will hear that. You have heard that, Joanne. I know you have. I know you I have. Know, and okay, I, I gotta I, run. I gotta run. I gotta run. I gotta fade him. One more before uh, we stop here. Steve in Ottawa. Steve. Hey Rob, how's it going? It goes, Steve. On the roads. What's your? All opinion? right, on the roads. Yeah. Uh, we got a city council that's uh, more interested in saving the world. Yes. Than, yeah. than fixing the roads. Okay. And uh, okay. The, the roads are getting worse, and I'll tell you why. All right. Years ago, around like 2005, I'm guessing. I don't know exactly the date, but there used to be little contractors that got jobs from the city and went around to fix the potholes. They had a little heater on the back of their truck that kept the asphalt warm, and they drove around and filled the potholes with two guys in the truck and a plate tamper. They stopped doing that because they were complaining about the quality of the asphalt. Okay. So now you have to have, like, union companies and union workers and, you know, city of Ottawa workers to go do this, you know? It was created a lot of jobs. Guys are making $1,000 a day doing this. Wow. Uh, through the 90s, through, you know, early 2000s, and then they put a stop to it. Okay. So if the roads are getting worse, that's one of the reasons. The other reason is they're spending money on electric buses that won't work in the winter. Well. And uh, building bike paths everywhere that are only used for six months of the year. They might as well be building snowmobile paths <laughs> because we have winter. We have well, as winter, long as they're electric snowmobiles. The electric. Well, all right. Yeah, zero electric emissions. Snowmobile paths. Snowmobiles. Okay. All right. That's the only. <laughs> and I'm wondering if that, that money is 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 it the eighty billion or eighty million, whatever it is, is going to fix just the potholes and the roads, or is it, it going says to fix road the resurfacing? The it says road resurfacing. So. Oh, is that, does that include building the bike paths on the side of the roads and the walking paths? No, I don't think it means resurfacing the roads. Oh. Steve, I'm guessing seventy six anyway. million. Seventy six million. It's frustrating. Seventy six million. Okay. All right. Ten forty five. Rob Snow Show.
We're talking about the roads. We're talking climate change. We're talking Wellington Street. Lots of stuff we're talking about this morning. Rob Snow Show, City News. On the Rob Snow Show. Have your say and call now. 613-750-1310. Yep, 1049, talk back hour, 1049. We're talking about the state of the road, the roads in Ottawa. Gen- just generally speaking, how would you describe the condition of the of the roads in Ottawa? It's that time of year. It's... Uh, it's pothole season. It's pothole season. And uh, a lot of people are wondering, are the roads in Ottawa actually getting worse? Some people are convinced they're actually getting worse. Um, so I want to ask you about that. There's also the future of Wellington Street. Um, we asked Bob Shirelli about that yesterday. Uh, he does not think it's really even feasible, just given the amount of traffic um, that that flows through Wellington Street on on any given day. It's not feasible to keep it closed longer term, although it has been it's been closed for quite some time now, um, kind of post occupation. And uh, there are certainly calls in some quarters to have that closed permanently to at least private vehicle traffic like your take on that. Uh, And as well, British Columbia climate change targets, new targets being announced today. Uh, a cut in greenhouse gas emissions of 45% by the year 2030, which is just eight years from now. How are we ever going to accomplish that? Uh, Professor Lee told me this morning, we are not. <laughs> we will not. It's impossible. Rodney uh, in Ottawa. Hi, Rodney. 
Hey, good day. Hi, Rodney. Hey, I got some good news on the roads for you. You do? Okay. Before I get into some of the other information I've been dying to get sort of corrected with 311 that hasn't worked in the last 15 years. You know, (laughs) not all all the roads in the city of Ottawa are in bad shape. Not all of them. There is one road that goes right across the city of Ottawa that is in as bad a shape as some of the city roads. Above the sound barrier, they'd have to put up nets to catch all the hubcaps. (laughs) That's, okay. the, that's the Queensway. The Queensway, okay. You know, All so right. It actually has good pavement when it is sort of paved and not under repair. Right, right, you know? okay. All right. And then uh, the big thing that I really wanted to mention, yep. that I've mentioned the 311, I mentioned a new one to them this year, and this was to do with their advertising. You know, Their advertising was to call in and give the city of Ottawa 311 information to where all the potholes are. This is so long ago. This is before the Internet. Well, this is like 15 years ago type thing. Okay. So the reason I came up with this idea was because I was driving behind a city of Ottawa pickup truck, and I was bouncing on the potholes because I couldn't see them because I'm behind the city of Ottawa pickup truck. And there's three employees. One's driving, one's on his cell phone, one's sleeping. So I came up with a brainwave. Any city of Ottawa vehicle, especially during pothole season, should have a clipboard where the extra employee can just look for, you know, repairs for a stitch in time to save nine type thing, you know? Okay, okay. okay. All right. Hey, and then there's um, uh, my new comment that I gave to 311, and this is I was driving down Baseline a few weeks ago, and I came into potholes, and the potholes were uh, in service cuts for infield housing, you know. So I was just sort of wondering, you know, uh, you know, uh, the people got charged, and part of the charge was for cutting up the road and hooking up sewer and stuff like that, and then they repave it, you know, and then there's potholes in it. Uh, you know, who should be paying for the pothole repair afterwards? Should right. the city of Ottawa well, be paying Well, not the city, for- not if the city didn't do it. Not if the city didn't do it, Rodney. Well, if the city repaired right. it, and then the homeowner, it's, you know, a new road, It's and then it's been cut into, yeah. and once the road's been cut into, it's a repaired road, and it's going to need repairs on the repair. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. I don't know about that, Rodney. Uh, I don't know. I think you're, it, it sounds kind of far-fetched what you're spinning there. Uh, 1053, every single line is available. That's all the complaints about the roads. I was willing to take complaints on the roads for the entire hour. You know how many people work... Um, for road services at the city of Ottawa, would you believe 1,500 full-time employees? 1,500 full-time employees? They have summer road operations and they have winter road operations. Summer road operations would be things like, this is this kind of in-depth stuff that you learn when you listen to the Rob Snow Show, okay? Street sweeping, pothole patching, it's that time of year, okay? asphalt patching, concrete repair. But also, David, if you work in the roads department, you are also uh, involved with street furniture maintenance. Okay. Street furniture. Yeah, like benches and that kind of thing. Oh, right. Okay. Right. right? Bridge flushing. The city has to do that. That's uh, clearing debris and dirt from 142 City bridges and overpasses. Maintaining the parking rides, cutting the grass, picking up the litter, taking care of all the guardrails, rural mailbox <laughs> replacement, <laughs> replacement, um, lawn repairs, operating and maintaining the Pretoria Bridge, waste receptacle maintenance, Painting and replacing city garbage cans, like a big operation. That's summer operations. And then you have uh, the winter operations, snow and ice management, roads, sidewalks, park and rides, snow dumps. We have seven citywide. Okay. Winter flooding, water pooling, snow fences, snowboards, snow markers, grit. Uh, in the spring, we have the spring melt litter pickup program. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about the road services budget. And you have to keep in mind, the city is really on its own when it comes to paying for the city roads. 
your uh, your federal government, your provincial government have no interest or desire to put any money into city roads. And I mean zero money into the city's roads. Okay. When it comes to maintaining city roads, that's up to the city. The upper levels of government, they'll put all kinds of money into things like public transit, you know, billions of dollars for LRT, gas revenue so you can go, bo- go out and buy new um, electric buses, this sort of thing. Nothing, nothing to fill a pothole in the city of Ottawa. And wouldn't you say it shows? <laughs> Paul Paul is in Nepean. Good morning, Paul. Good morning, Rob. Yeah, hi, Paul. Uh, just a quick obs- observation. Um I used to live on Glebe Avenue in 1988. Okay, yeah. I I drove the road many times, many times, and had lots of bumps and potholes and everything. Uh, it's still the same, exactly the same. Oh, really? Except uh, a little uh, bike path at the end of it as it approaches Percy. Okay. That's it. That's all that's been done in like 34 years. Really? Nothing. And and how would you describe the state of that road, Glebe Avenue? It's uh, no, it's got lots of well, all all in inside of Glebe, lots of bumps, lots, lots of, of bumps, uh, yeah. potholes. Yes, potholes right. and like repaired. Must spots be that, must be uh, Glebe. Must not be paying enough property tax on Glebe yeah, Avenue. Yeah, <laughs> most likely. <laughs> <laughs> what do you figure they're paying in property tax for a big house on Glebe Avenue? Oh, nine. Oh yeah, oh, I would suspect and go up from there and go up from there. Absolutely. Last call, Sean in Ottawa. Sean. Hey, good morning. How are hey, you? Hey, Sean. Good. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Good. Yeah. On the we'll roads. Touch on, yeah. Touch on three things, I guess. Uh, yep. First, the roads. I mean, they are what they are. Uh, they are what they are. You know, <laughs> it, it, it sounds like you don't get, you know, you don't think too much of them. They are what they are. Yeah. Well, it, it's, it's the tosh ball that cracks, it breaks up and yeah. you got to try and patch as fast as you can, but then it freezes again and, you know, it, it you go to Montreal, at least our bridges aren't falling on our head, right? So I suppose so. Uh, okay. Can't complain yeah. about too much. Uh, the main thing I want to say... Oh, we can uh, complain. Ottawa. We can complain. Don't worry about it, Sean. Yeah, we can yeah, complain a whole lot. Yeah. yeah. It wouldn't be Ottawa without complaining. Yep. Um, but Wellington Street, I think it should stay uh, closed like it is. Uh, I love okay. downtown. And, uh, you know, the Alberts later are great conduits for moving the traffic uh, east and west. But I would say if you, they do say that, keep that, they would have to change or make better that uh, passageway down from Wellington through uh, Sussex and the Rideau-Sussex intersection. That's, okay. They'd have yep, to reconfigure yep, yep. the lights, the signals there, and, and allow for a better flow of traffic, because otherwise we'll just back up down Elgin. Be a real mess. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, yep, so, yep. Okay, good stuff, Sean. Thank you. Think it out loud yep. there. Love it. Thank you. Thanks for all your calls. Really interesting this morning. Kind of all over the place. Maybe a little scattered. I'll try to be more focused tomorrow, but that's okay. Michael Tobe, my friend on the right side of things, right after the news on City News.
local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Tuesday, March 29th. Good morning, I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa, minus 7 degrees. It's minus 6 in Smith Falls. And here's what's making news in Ottawa and the Valley. The federal government has unveiled its new climate plan to reduce emissions before the end of the decade. The documents have been released. Eleven previous attempts have been made since 1988. None have been successful. With the details of the latest plan, here's City News Parliament Hill reporter Cormac McSweeney. This plan includes $9.1 billion in new investments. The government says it reflects economy-wide measures such as carbon pricing and clean fuels while also targeting actions sector by sector. Now, the uh, investments will go to help reduce energy costs for homes and buildings, make it easier for Canadians to switch to electric vehicles, and help industries develop and adopt clean technology in their journey to net zero emissions. Uh, The plan also projects the oil and gas industry will need to cut greenhouse gas emissions by 40% from current levels by 2030 if the country is to meet its targets. Uh, They also project that electricity emissions will be almost zero by the end of the decade. Um, We will hear later from Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, who will uh, further outline this plan in a speech at the Globe Conference in Vancouver. Uh, This plan being tabled is a legal requirement under the net zero accountability law that the Liberals passed last year. The goal is to reduce emissions to no more than 60% of 2005 levels by 2030. Canada has issued at least 11 plans and set nine different emissions targets since 1988, but we've never met a single one. Cormac McSweeney, Parliament Hill. City News Time 1103, and now your forecast with meteorologist Jill Taylor. Well, we're okay for today with sun and cloud, the high near zero, but we're already under a special weather statement for Wednesday with snow, ice pellets, freezing rain possible Wednesday afternoon and Wednesday night. So heads up for that. For today, the high zero. And right now in Ottawa, minus 7 degrees. In Smith Falls, it's minus 6. The provincial government, with a plan of its own today, this would be to better prepare for future health emergencies. Here's City News reporter Richard Southern. The government announcing new legislation today. It's calling it a plan to stay open. It's basically an initiative to make sure the province is better equipped to respond to any new health care crisis. Health Minister Christine Elliott. Looking back, the most important lesson we've learned is that we cannot allow ourselves to be unprepared again. This new plan would require annual reporting on supplies of personal protective equipment and require the province to have a provincial emergency plan that's updated every five years. The government also announcing $81 million over two years to expand a program in which nurse graduates can receive their full tuition back in exchange for practicing in an underserved community for two years. Also included in this legislation is a permanent pay raise for PSW, something that was previously announced. Richard Southern, City News. City News Time 1104. Russia says it is changing military tactics in central Ukraine. The Kremlin's deputy defense minister says Moscow's decided to fundamentally cut back operations near Kiev and Chernihiv to increase mutual trust at negotiations aimed at ending the fighting. The statement comes after another round of talks between Russia and Ukraine are held in Istanbul and appears to be the first major concession Russia's made since the beginning of their invasion in Ukraine more than a month ago. Ukraine's military general's staff said earlier it has no withdrawals at the two cities. I'm Charles de la Desma. The Senators play tonight in Nashville. It's an 8 o'clock start, less than one day after finding out the team owner, Eugene Melnick, had died. NHL Commissioner Gary Bettman says the words passion and commitment define Melnick. Besides his many business dealings, Melnick was an honorary colonel in the Canadian Armed Forces, a successful thoroughbred horse breeder, and supported numerous charities in both Canada and and Barbados Melnick was 62 years old. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. Firm. Fair. Fun. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News, 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Well, it's great to have back on the Rob Snow Show, my friend on the right side of things, syndicated columnist, former speechwriter for Stephen Harper. Michael Tobe is uh, back with us on City News. Good morning, Michael. Hey, good morning, Rob. Yes. How are you? No, I'm. I'm. Um, uh, how am I? How am I? I'm feeling uh, worried. Worried. That's how I feel. 
Um, my you produ- are every week. What else is new? <laughs> my producer, David, just popped in and said he's been going through some of the um, some of the new environment plan that's just yep. been uh, revealed by the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change, uh, okay. Stephen Gibo, uh, who is I- I- in unveiling the latest climate change greenhouse gas emissions target, for example, from, from the Trudeau government, as I mentioned to my listeners, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. If climate change is your big issue, and there are a lot of people in the country, that's their big issue. Um, right. Emissions have only gone up since Trudeau came to power six years. Every year, emissions have, have gone up. Yep. Now they've declared a climate crisis. The clock is ticking. You know the whole story. Mm-hmm. And the new target is we're going to cut greenhouse gas emissions in this country by 45% by the year 2030. 2030 is not that far away. No. Uh, eight years from now. It's just eight years from now. Now, David is with us here. Uh, what are some of the other notable highlights here, David, that you've managed to kind of dig out of this? What is it, almost 300-page uh, document? Yeah, it's here. 271 pages. 271 so. pages. <laughs> I've a, got a lot of reading to it's do. It's a meaty tonight. plan, okay. some good homework for you. The top, uh, one of the top line numbers that's already grabbing some headlines is the whole 2050 net zero scheme hinges on a 42% reduction in emissions from the oil and gas sector specifically. Okay. So they, right. the oil and gas sector needs to do a, hot, a lot of heavy lifting for Mr. Gilbo's plan here. Tw- by 2030, they need to cut their emissions from that one sector 42% below 2019 levels. In eight years. In eight years. In eight years. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, what about electric cars? What's the. There what's is the... a lot of money in here for electric cars. Oh, no cars. kidding. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Can you imagine that? They're going to spend $400 million. Sorry, not spend. It's an investment. It's always it's an, an investment. investment. Investing yes. yeah. $400 million in. Uh, in charging stations, they hope to build 50,000 charging stations mm. for a network across Canada, 400 okay. million there. I, I don't know why that's the government's job, but one point one point seven billion, one point seven billion dollars for consumer subsidies to buy electric vehicles. Wow. Oh God. And this is new. This one caught my eye. Sales mandates, sales quotas, mandated sales quotas for light duty electric vehicles. They want... 60% by 2030 and 100% by 2035. Yikes. By 2035. Okay. Well, we'll see if the industry can get there ahead of these government mandates. But, um, wow, that's um, – he's a okay. radical environmentalist, and that's, I guess, the kind of plan that you would expect from uh, – Mr. Gibo, what do you what do you think of what you're hearing, Michael? Yeah. yeah, no, I appreciate David's numbers as well. I have not gone through the massive 271 page tome quite yet. Um, you're right. I mean, unfortunately, this he is a radical environmentalist, whether you like Mr. Gibo or not. That really is his his world. It comes from Greenpeace, and he obviously has been traveling those circles for many many years. But irrespective of that, the program that's come out really fits the mantra of a radical environmental agenda. Um, costly. I mean, I think there's no question of that. And I'm sure in the other remaining pages, I'll find other costs that are awful. But what David has highlighted, um, you know, the, the worst of the lot really is the fact that they're trying to move to a mode where we're going to be basically all onto electric cars, you know, in a time span that is not only very short and narrow, but is not cost effective. You know, the average cost of electric electric vehicles is i forget it's about what sixty thousand plus depending on what you put in it yeah i'm just sort of doing that as a quick run through because yeah, i have to go that. to tesla and look at yeah, yeah that's and that, that you know some people can certainly afford that and obviously the government has in the past ontario and otherwise has offered obviously certain tax credits if you buy it but the overall cost for people is way above their means so you would have to bring down the vehicles by certainly more than 50% to make it even viable for a significant portion of the population to move to it. And plus, I agree with you, Rob, you made the comment offhand. It was the first thing I was thinking, too. The fact that the government is getting into the business of creating these electric stations where we would, you know, insert things. We would obviously juice up the cars so we can continue on for long periods of time, presumably a day or two in general. It's an enormous cost. You know, taxpayers will be, you know, taking the entire yeah. bill. I guess. And most of us haven't moved to that. And most of us have, whether you call them gas filters or not, we're on those vehicles that we're not just going to give them up willy nilly and yeah. willingly. 
Um, right now, it sounds, you know, it's obviously it's ambitious. No question about that. I'll give them that much. Yeah. But it's not realistic. Not realistic. Yeah. I guess I guess I'm just coming kind of coming at this as a, uh, you know, a small government, small C kind of conservative here. Yeah. Um, Me too. I, I, you know, I, 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 I don't think it's the government's job to be sending checks to otherwise affluent people who would otherwise buy an electric car. Correct. I've always been opposed to that. Me too. The Me research too. has shown that the people who buy electric cars would have bought them anyway for any number of reasons. Maybe they're environmentally conscious. Maybe they do it for financial reasons because they want to save on gas. They don't want to pay a dollar eighty or a dollar seventy five a liter for gas. Sure. I mean, uh, there are any number of reasons, but it's mostly the affluent who are buying those vehicles. They don't need the help. They don't need no. the help. Um, and you know some of the some of the rebates, you know, seven, eight, ten thousand dollars. Well, that's what we ask someone in Ontario who's collecting the Ontario Disability Support Program. We ask that person to live on that for the entire year. That's so right. So there's an equity problem that I have with it. And yep. why is it the government's job to build the charging infrastructure? <laughs> the I don't the know. government didn't build the gas stations. No. Um, if the market opportunity is there, because I, I think we all see this is where the industry is going anyway. General Motors, Ford, Volvo, uh, mm-hmm. they've all said, we're hoping that we won't even, you know, 20 years from now, we won't even sell a gas-powered car. That's right. Um, so, obviously, there's going to be market forces at work because there will be a market opportunity to sell people the new gasoline which will be a charging station right so i I don't know it seems like a giant waste of money to me but yeah yeah, no it does yeah look i'm a small c conservative too rob obviously i mean it's no big secret and i agree with most of what you said and it's just not realistic and you're quite right i mean i'm not going to cherry pick or parrot everything you said but you know those who have purchased electric vehicles like teslas and others have obviously have the money before already up front to pay for them because the costs are so exorbitant that most average people can't afford them so the rebates that are offered sure it's nice but does it really make a difference and you're quite right it wouldn't have prevented them from purchasing those vehicles in the first place and government intervention on so many things including the the stations where the you know the cars will be powered up it isn't government's role that way and for those who think the government should intervene on everything you know, you have to look at it realistically. You know, we, we spend an enormous amount on daily measures, whatever it is, you know, food, clothing, diapers if we have new children, mortgage, you know, mortgage rates, et cetera, et cetera. We pay more than enough in taxes. Our taxes are going to continue to go way up. Look, the carbon tax is supposed to rise yet again, for example. Yeah. This, all of these things, yeah, in theory, they all sound nice, you know, because, you know, they're on a piece of paper. It's like, oh, good, we'll do it this way. There'll be no more gas, you know, cars that run on gas being put on the highways or on our roads. It all sounds nice, but the cost is exorbitant, and we pay it. It doesn't matter whether you earn a small wage salary where you're paid by the hour or you have lots of money. We all pay for it. Realistically, you're right that obviously market forces will naturally drive the prices of electric vehicles down. They have to. There's no other way to move in this direction. And the major auto companies are going to move that way. So that's all perfectly fine. But the actual cost of setting all this up, well, it only comes from us. And is this exactly what you want? If it is, then you'll be happy to know that your taxes will go way up. You know, it'll go up for personal, corporate. It's going to go way, way up. But if you're realistic or if you want to make sure that you have a proper amount of savings as time goes along, you can't buy everything and you can't rely on government for every single measure that you take in life. You have to do things independently and you have to allow the private sector and private enterprise to thrive. It can't under these conditions. Okay. All right. Pierre Polyev, let's uh, talk about him. Pierre Polyev uh, has been accused in the last few days of uh, courting the lunatic fringe when he talks about things like Bitcoin, blockchain being critical to personal freedom. Um, has Pierre been reading too much Ayn Rand? What's going on uh, there? <laughs> well, Bitcoin didn't exist during the days of Ayn Rand, but I know what you're... I know she would love it, though. <laughs> she, yes, she would. You're right. I think yeah. I can speak authoritatively. Yeah, she would. Look... 
Um, I, for the record, I don't believe in cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, and I have opposed them since the very beginning because you're, you're purchasing something that is supposed to re replace the existing currency of a country with what and, for, and to what means and to what ends. You know, El Salvador, for example, as of right now, is the only country that has made Bitcoin their official currency, but that's also because El Salvador's currency had fallen down to nothing. So when you have nothing, of course you're going to look for other things. Okay. It's astonishing that countries like Venezuela and others haven't moved in that direction as of yet, and maybe they will. But look, again, interest in Bitcoin and blockchain is one thing, and certainly if Mr. Polyapra and his wife, apparently according to some interviews he did, if they're interested in it and learning more about it, that's perfectly fine. The fact that the show that uh, the person that he went on has made some, quite frankly, some screwball comments, well, there's lots of screwballs out there. So one way or the other, you know, it is what it is. But am I worried about this or do I think that Pierre Pauli ever is leading a charge for Bitcoin in Canada? No, no? because I okay. think he wants to learn for interest sake. He's a bright guy. Yeah. Why can't he learn things? Even if there are things we don't necessarily agree with, I don't think there's anything wrong with learning about this. Reputable organizations, including Bloomberg, actually study and write about and research cryptocurrency. Oh, all the time. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So there's nothing yeah. wrong with no, it. No, no, no. It's a big thing in business news now. Yeah. It really is. Yeah, crypto. And so, they, yeah. so it's legitimate whether people like it or not. Yeah. All right. Very interesting stuff this week. Thank you, Michael. We'll speak soon. You bet. Take yeah, care. Bye bye. Syndicated columnist, former speechwriter for Stephen Harper. Michael Tobe. When we come back, David Sally from the Ottawa Business Journal. This is the Rob Snow Show on City News. Riding requires attention and focus. No distractions, no moment of unawareness, because one brief moment can cost a lifetime of other moments. Everyone deserves to arrive home. Maritime provinces are home to some of the oldest settlements in Canadian history. But did you know that one of the first was actually started by black settlers? Take a minute to learn about the rise and untimely fall of Africville. Black people have lived in Nova Scotia since before the founding of Halifax in 1749, but it wasn't until after the American Revolution in the late 1700s and early 1800s that large groups of black settlers began to arrive in the province, many of whom were former slaves promised freedom and land in Nova Scotia. What they encountered when they arrived, however, was racist treatment by their white neighbours and government officials. This pushed many black people to build homes on the outskirts of town instead. But despite the area receiving little support from government officials and lacking necessities like functioning sewage systems, access to clean water, and proper garbage disposals, the tight-knit community persevered. And so Africville was born. For more than 150 years, the small community grew, expanding from just a few homes to a population of over 400 people. Everything changed, however, in 1964, when plans for a new bridge and the idea of urban renewal prompted the municipality to set its sights on Africville's land. Instead of investing in the community, officials approved a relocation program that promised free job training and employment assistance to help residents through relocation. But the reality wasn't so kind. Residents had their belongings moved in city dump trucks and homes were demolished immediately after their owners left. Of the 400 plus people living in Africville, only 14 residents held clear legal titles to their land, so the rest were only given $500 with the promise of more social aid in the future. Not much else was actually done to support Africville and its residents until 2001, when a United Nations report called for reparations to be paid to the community. In 2010, Halifax Mayor Peter Kelly apologized for the atrocities against Africville as part of a $4.5 million compensation deal. In 2021, Councillor Lindell Smith put forward a seven-part motion to plan for the future of Africville alongside local organizations and the descendants of former residents. Today, there's a public park and museum where Africville once stood to teach visitors about the history of the land and its community. If you've never heard of Africville, you're not alone. The tragic story of this small black community in Nova Scotia is not as well known as it should be.
Pillar of community opinion. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. David Sally's back with us from the Ottawa Business Journal. These are exciting times at the Ottawa Business Journal because uh, one of their annual reports is out on Ottawa's fastest growing companies. Good morning, David. Good morning, Rob. Yeah, great to hear from you. So you've been kind of uh, you know, teasing them out. You had five out yesterday, and you're supposed to come out with five today. We just posted, oh, our, you just posted. Uh, our top okay. five, Rob. Yep. This is the fastest growing companies 2022 edition. Correct. And number one is? Number one is Bush Bomb. Bush uh, Bomb. Is, of course, yeah. natural skin care. Correct. And their growth at that company has been what? <laughs> five thousand is it? Five thousand percent. Yep. Five thousand percent. Over the last three years, yeah. Three I mean, they started. They God. basically just started about three years ago. Really, a little more than that. And right. uh, and you know, came up with uh, with this idea that's just that's just taken off like gangbusters. Uh, Rob, they were on Dragon's Den. They um, okay, okay. they did land funny, but the, uh, I believe that kind of fell through. But they it didn't matter because they uh, um, they have just they they've been growing and um, uh, through mo- mostly I think uh, bootstrapped and just been able to. I mean now their revenues are in the, you know uh, you, you know have just grown as you can see exponentially from virtually nothing. Um, yeah. And they're now distributing. All over, well, all over the country, other parts of the world. It's um, it's just one of those real, real neat stories, Rob. I guess you uh, could say yeah, like it is a um, it is a bikini line skincare company, is how it exactly. is described in the Ottawa Business Journal Spring Correct. Magazine this year. Correct. Okay. All right. Um, <laughs> fastest growing company in Ottawa, and it was yeah. one of the top three last year. So it's on, it been on it a was, real roll. It was third. Yes. Uh, so absolutely. number two, and again, uh, this was in the top five last year, is a company called Noibu. What do they do Noibu. there? Yeah. Noibu, well, Noibu is one of those companies that's really just flourished during the pandemic for obvious reasons when you find out what they do. They're an e-commerce error monitoring platform. So okay. Okay. they, you know, they go through, they basically... Um, if you know whatever you might be uh, an e-commerce software or Shopify merchant, whatever they go, they check your site for bugs and make sure that it keeps running smoothly. Uh, so as you can imagine, Rob, that's uh, that's a business that that has just taken off uh, and gone through the roof uh, over the last two years. So um, uh, again, their growth over over 1,700 um, percent since uh, since 2019. So. You know, uh, again, in the right place at the right time with the right product, uh, and there you go. And number three, this was the fastest growing company last year. It's dropped to number three, but still impressive. Three year yeah. growth, almost fourteen hundred percent. Is uh, the last mile delivery company Go for Delivers? Go for Delivers, exactly. Mm-hmm. They're specialized, as you say, last mile delivery. They started in the construction space, working with. Companies like uh, like Home Depot, for example, where they and they do handle most of Home Depot's uh, sort of last minute, last mile deliveries across Canada, and they're expanding um, uh, rapidly in the U.S. Uh, this is another, and they're they're signing partnerships seemingly every week with new um, transportation companies. They're especially big in the green transportation space. They're really working with a lot of electric vehicle fleets uh, to try and make. Last mile delivery, carbon negative. That is their goal, uh, okay. Rob, and they and they're and they're working really hard to get there quickly. Okay. Number four, Ottawa Deck and Rail. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's Ottawa an interesting one, rail. right? Yeah, big sure. uh, home improvement. I guess it's like they're in the home improve. You know, they're like home improvement. Uh, uh, equipment and supplies, I guess. Right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's yeah. right. Which is obviously, again, people have been at home uh, throughout the pandemic. What do you do? You've got this money. You're not spending it uh, going out. Yeah. So I want a new deck. <laughs> right? yeah, I want a new exactly. deck. Who should I call? Maybe Ottawa Deck and Rail. How about that? Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, I love this. What has been the biggest challenge you have faced in relation to the fast growth of your company? Supply chain management. No kidding. Right. 
Yeah. I think, Rob, you could either, uh, you could just about right now ask any company in Ottawa, what's your biggest challenge? If it's not finding enough, uh, finding the right people or enough of the right people, it's supply chain. Yeah. So, yes. Finding the right people or finding the right stuff, right? And number right. five, we'll round out the top five here. Um, Ottawa Valley Meats. Wow. An egg, an yep. egg company. An ag company, uh, farm to plate, sort of e-commerce. Uh, so very, you know, high end, locally, locally raised meats. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, you order your farm meat, and they deliver it to you. And uh, it's raised on farms right here in the Ottawa Valley. And um, and that's um, and these days, Rob, I mean, people are more than ever um, cognizant of what they're putting in their bodies, and they and they want it to be local, sustainable, healthy, you know, all of that stuff. So uh, Ottawa Valley Meats has really uh, has really been able to benefit from that trend. Wow, that's amazing. So where can people, um, people can go to obj.ca, but uh, also if, uh, if they want, they can uh, download the Spring Magazine and, and read Correct. all about it, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Go to obj.ca. It's at the bottom of our of our homepage, you'll find the link to the new uh, new edition, the spring edition of, uh, of the OBJ News Magazine, and the virtual edition is all right there, and it's uh, it's jam packed with not, I mean, the fastest growing companies is obviously the, um, I guess you might say the um, uh, uh, sort of the cover uh, um, uh, cover cover issue, uh, sort 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 of the, the big cover story, yeah. but there's all kinds of stuff, all kinds of great content. In there, um, uh, we've we've got um, uh, Mark Shutcliffe's column on the future of the workplace. We've got a a great um, a great profile actually of Andrew Reeves, a well-known architect who designed Shopify space on uh, Elgin Street. Oh, okay. Um, okay. He talks about how uh, you know everything is going to change in office space in the post-pandemic world and how design is going to reflect that. So those are just a couple of the. Um, uh, of the uh, the great articles that, that you'll find in the new edition of the news magazine. Look forward to that. Hey, thank you, David. All right. Great Thanks, to hear Rob. from you. Yeah, yeah, really interesting list. Uh, a little bit of uh, everything on that list. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, coming right up, uh, right after the news, the latest on interest rates and uh, could what's happening with interest rates actually be signaling the R word? recession. When we come back, Sal Guadiari, Senior Economist at the Bank of Montreal, will join us. This is City News. Being a crossing guard works great as part of my schedule as a high school student because I still have time to do my tests and assignments while earning a little bit of cash on the side. It fits, working as a crossing guard fits into my current lifestyle because it gives me a lot of time during the day to pursue hobbies that I'm very interested in. A friend of mine introduced me to this job. Uh, I didn't know it was actually a, a paid job. I always start my day, it's a very little, I guess, few months baby, and she always comes with her dad on a pram and uh, the smile she has, like, oh my God. Well, I think the OSC is a, a very good employer. Uh, they, they show quite clearly that they care about you. They're very polite. They really make you feel like you're part of a family. It's fun. I really enjoy it. Gets us out of the house, too. Yeah.
number one for local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. This is Tuesday, the 29th of March. Good morning, I'm Jason White. Right now in Ottawa, mainly sunny and minus 6. It's minus 5 in Smith Falls. The wind making it feel more like minus 15. Here's what's making news this hour. Tributes continue to pour in for the late Senator's owner, Eugene Melnick. He died yesterday of an unknown illness, seven years after undergoing a liver transplant. Melnick was 62. Ottawa police identifying the victim in the capital's latest murder. 24-year-old Marie Gabriel of Ottawa was found dead in a townhouse on Hetherington Road near Walkley and Albion yesterday morning. The investigation continues. No word of any arrests. The City of Ottawa wants to redevelop one of its Byward Market parking garages. City Hall is looking for proposals for the site currently occupied by its garage at 70 Clarence Street. No firm timeline, but the city would like to have things done in the next five years. Temporary highway speed limit increases are here to stay. The province plans to make the 110 kilometer an hour speed limits permanent on several stretches of highway, including the 417 east of Ottawa to the Quebec border, as well as the 4 17 between Arnprior and Canada. The province began testing out higher speed limits in 2019. Those will be made permanent as of April 22nd. City News Time 1132. I'm Jason White. For news anytime, follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. He's the opinionated Ottawa icon. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Okay, so we're going to talk about interest rates right now. Very important to pay attention to uh, interest rates right now. Sal Guadiari is Senior Economist at BMO Capital Markets and joins me this morning here on City News. Good morning. Good morning, Rob. What is an inverted yield curve? Well, an inverted yield curve is when uh, longer-term interest rates uh, fall below shorter-term rates. Um, it's something that normally happens when the market is anticipating um, a fairly aggressive course of monetary tightening that drives up short-term or policy rates and at the same time starts anticipating in, as a result or consequence of those rate hikes the economy getting into trouble basically slipping into recession and therefore you know down the road the uh, central bank will need to cut interest rates reverse uh, policy course so that's basically what the, uh, an inverted yield curve is it's it's got a great track record over history if you go back a half century and just say look at the u.s story uh, pretty well every recession is uh, um, was preceded by an inverted yield curve and basically uh, you know a course of monetary tightening the fed raising interest rates um, so great track record now, not you know every uh, tightening cycle or even every uh, period where the yield curve is pretty flat uh, ends up in a, uh, leading to a recession but uh, ignore it at your peril. I mean, it, it's ignore definitely it worth paying peril. very close okay. attention to the yield curve because um, uh, it is, again, the single best predictor of uh, an economic uh, downturn. So right now, just watching the ticker here, for example, a two-year bond in the United States. These are U.S. rates, but a two-year bond is 2.3%, the rate, whereas a 10-year bond is a 2.4 percent rate so not quite inverted but flat and it was briefly inverted on some of the some of the maturities right uh, uh within the last week so this has people wondering uh-oh uh-oh are we headed for a, a recession what do you think on that question yeah, so it depends what segment of the yield curve you're looking at. Uh, certainly uh, between the 10-year and the 2-year rate, it's pretty flat. Uh, the 10-year rate still a few basis points above 2 years, but you know it's, it's actually below the 5-year rate now, so it's inverted at that that portion. Okay. The 30-year rate is below the 5-year rate, so again, inverted. But um, importantly, if you, if you 
if you just compare some of the shorter term rates, three month treasuries against 10 year rates, still pretty sharp, uh, steeply and positively sloped. And again, that, that simply uh, means uh, the market is anticipating the Fed will need to raise interest rates pretty fairly aggressively over the next year. That's going to drive up shorter term rates. And again, we're probably going to get close to uh, inverting the yield curve. But uh, right now, I, I, I'd suggest there's a pretty low risk of a, of, of a recession this year. And again, that's what the um, the shorter term rates are telling us. Um, uh, basically, interest rates are still fairly low. I mean, the Fed has a lot of work ahead of itself. Same story with the Bank of Canada to um, basically normalize policy, take rates back to more neutral levels, which are probably you know a good two percentage points above uh, above current levels in in Canada and the U.S. And that's basically what we're expecting over the next year is both central banks to raise rates oh, about two percentage points or so, a little more for the Fed than the Bank Canada, just given higher inflation in the U.S. Um, now, now, that still probably won't be enough to trigger a recession. Again, uh, it still um, would leave interest rates close to neutral levels, not levels that would be so high that they would force uh, people to retrench and businesses to pull back spending and push the economy into recession. I think if we see interest rates or policy rates going up you know, to 4% or higher over the next one to two years, that would be kind of recession territory. I mean, that, that would almost certainly uh, result in an inverted yield curve and the market would start um, uh, eventually pricing in um, rate cuts to address um, that period of economic weakness. But we're still a good ways from that, um, you know, that scenario. Yeah. And I think there's other... You're factors. not in the rate cut camp, I don't think. Oh, right no. Now, right? yeah. It's just rate cuts for, no, not, not no. for a long time because, I mean, both central banks are, are so-called behind the inflation curve and they've got a lot of catching up to do to tackle inflation, return it to their their 2% targets. Um, and again, that's that's what the market is, is fearing, that both central banks, Fed and Bank Canada, will, need, will possibly need to over-tighten, you know, overshoot uh, their neutral policy rates, and that would tend to cause economic trouble and, and possibly a recession. So that's the risk right now. But it's not, uh, you know, a, a done deal. I mean, it's quite possible. In fact, our base case view is inflation will start to moderate in the second half of this year and through next year, and central banks um, will achieve that so-called coveted soft landing um, that uh, where we avoid a recession. I think there's a few other factors as well. The number one thing is we don't expect interest rates to go up even at the end of this tightening cycle to such high levels to to. to spur a recession, but there's also all those um, extra savings that mm -hmm. households in aggregate have, have built up through the pandemic that will support spending. We're still seeing a fairly positive wealth effect in the two countries from rising house prices. Um, and, you know, in, in Canada, stock price is still going up. So, I mean, that could turn. The stock market could could correct and uh, house prices could correct. Uh, but that would be a different situation. And that, you know, that, that could cause economic trouble. But right now, we're just, we're just not seeing that. What does it mean to normalize uh, monetary policy or be, have a new, more neutral monetary policy? What yeah. does that mean? Yeah, uh, well, before the uh, pandemic, uh, when the economies, uh, both the U.S. and Canada, were fairly healthy, uh, fairly robust, um, we saw policy rates in Canada and the U.S. kind of in that 3% or a little less territory. And that's kind of thought to be pretty close to so-called neutral. Somewhere in the, oh, it's a wide range, 2% to 3% okay. would be, um, you know, a, a, a level of policy rates or short-term rates that's consistent with steady inflation and steady, modest economic growth in line, in line with long-term normal economic growth. So not too hot, not too cold. What's happened, of course, through the pandemic, both central banks had to slash their interest rates almost to zero, well below neutral to, to stimulate the economy. Now the, the game is to get back to neutral. You know, get, get rates probably above 2%. Hopefully that'll cool off demand enough, cool off inflation pressures, and you know the expansion will continue. The fear, of course, in markets, uh, and that's why the 10-year rate is, is not terribly high right now, mm -hmm. not, not much above the two-year rate, um, is that both central banks might need to over-tighten and raise rates more aggressively, and that would cause economic trouble. Right, right, right. Okay, okay. 
How would you characterize right now what Bank of Canada officials have been saying about their plans for interest rate hikes? Is it still your expectation that it would be a series of 25 basis point moves that seem to be the consensus not that long ago, or that the, the, the bank will have to be m- more aggressive and that maybe some f- a 50 basis point interest rate hike I- is not out of the question. What, what, what's the buzz? Well, Rob, prior to a recent speech by the Bank of Canada Deputy Governor, we, we were just anticipating quarter point rate hikes uh, over the next year, up to about 2%. But in light of, of her speech um, and her warning that the bank is prepared to act forcefully in dealing with inflation, you know, mm-hmm. returning inflation to the 2% target, and it's, it's now close to 6% in Canada, um, we, we changed our view. We, we think the Bank Canada will raise rates uh, at each of the next two meetings um, by 50 basis points. Uh, and then kind of shift back to more measured uh, quarter point uh, rate hike path. But ultimately, we're probably going to see the Bank of Canada raising its policy rate up to about 2.5% a year from now. Uh, again, back to new, more neutral levels, uh, more consistent with you know s- uh, steadier inflation, lower inflation, and steady economic growth. But again, given the starting point where inflation is right now uh, it's so high, that there is that risk. Uh, they may need to go more, and you know that's when we'll have to really pay close attention to the yield curve because that probably would start to signal uh, economic troubles. Okay. Okay. How would you uh, describe right now the health of the Canadian economy? The the you know the labor market has bounced back. You mentioned. Um, Household savings that have been uh, built up throughout the course of the the, the pandemic. Uh, there there has been economic growth, but certainly inflation is not what the bank likes to see, and maybe the biggest economic threat right now. But how how would you describe things right now, Sal? So? Well, I think Canada's economy is in pretty good shape, okay. um, at least through through this year until interest rates go up. Uh, again, because of um, you know very high aggregate household savings accumulated through the the pandemic that will support spending uh, that wealth effect from you know past increases in house prices and and the TSX is still you know close to record territory um, and in a way Canada has benefited from this latest uh, surge in commodity prices you know a lot of the things that we sell to the rest of the world energy food uh, wheat for example base metals have all gone up a yep, lot in yep. value, and we're running, you know, um, consistent current account and trade surpluses now. So that's benefiting our economy, even though consumers have had to cut back, you know, because more of their money is going down the gas tank or, you know, at the grocery store. It's just more expensive. But on net, those higher commodity prices have, have been a boon to Canada's economy. So I think we're well positioned. Uh, this year, uh, until you know, next year it's going to be a bit of a challenge. Though it went, you know, when inter- interest rates are higher, uh, the housing market will probably have cooled down by then. So that's when things get a little trickier. Uh, we'll have to, you know, worry a little more about um, a, a sharper economic downturn if things don't go right. And the biggest thing that needs to go right after you know, the war kind of ending fairly soon um, uh, is that inflation needs to roll over, moderate, which we expect in the second half of this year and through next year. If that doesn't happen, we're going to see much higher interest rates. And that's when our antenna for you know, recession antenna goes up. Okay. All right. Thank you, Sal Guadiari. Always great to uh, have your insights, sir, and ask you these questions. Thank you. Take care, Rob. Yeah, bye-bye from uh, the economics team at the Bank of Montreal, Sal Guadiari. We'll talk about Canada's planned purchase six years after scrapping a planned purchase. Uh, Canada's now planned purchase of the F-35s coming right up with Richard Shimuka from the McDonnell laurier Institute. This is City News. Sunrise for each and every day Cause it only takes 
Strong voice. Strong opinions. Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It was revealed yesterday by the Minister of National Defense and the Minister of Procurement for the uh, federal government that Canada will enter into negotiations with Lockheed Martin and buy the F-35 fighter jet. This is six years after cancelling the Harper government's plan to buy the same the same aircraft let's talk about this Uh, Richard Shamuka is here senior fellow McDonald Laurier Institute good morning yeah nice nice to hear from you Um, what do you think of this decision uh, it's nothing's really changed in 12 years since the uh, the conservative government uh, decided to sole source the aircraft back then and we've just basically watched two different governments uh, play politics with a file that if you t- look at the bureaucracy and all of the sort of reports and assessments that were done was really consistent in its view that this aircraft was the one that should have been selected right from the get-go. Okay. What makes it the right aircraft for Canada? Well, it, there's a couple ways to cut it. I okay. think the easiest way to explain it is that in the 1990s, uh, most Western states required a replacement for the fighter aircraft that they bought in the 1980s. We did uh, because we bought our CF-18 around 1988. A lot of countries bought the F-16 in Europe. Uh, and even in the U.S., uh, there was something called the carter Reagan buildup. They bought thousands of fighters of this type for the Air Force, Navy, and Marine Corps. And so the United States government decided to build one aircraft to replace all of them. And that was that became the F-35. And what's happened in since they selected the F-35 in, uh, in 19, or sorry, 2001, basically it has replaced almost every single major type in Europe and in, in the United States and in, in Asia where the United States 
know, had sold these aircraft and were basically one of the last countries to, you know, to finally select it, even though we had selected before, when we were one of the first members of the industrial program to design and build the fighter. Right. So our allies are flying this aircraft, right? Yes, absolutely. Every okay. in, There has not been a competition that the F-35 was in that it's actually lost. Uh, there's three components to looking at how it got selected. The capability side, there's not really a capability that kind of matches it. The cost side, because it's produced at such a scale that you're looking at billing it 100, 120, 180 per year, there's no, there's nothing that's actually built at that scale, so it actually is much cheaper. And then the industrial benefits side, and a lot of, because we build components for all F-35s, That's right. it actually makes it cheaper, for, or it actually yeah. makes it, it has per, uh, better. And even though, even better. though, as I understand it, uh, even though we we did not purchase the aircraft, and it basically told Lockheed Martin we have no intention of ever buying the aircraft, we still wanted to be part of that program, the program that said, hey, uh, if you're in this program, not only do you get to do subcontracting work on the planes that you were going to buy, but you're going to get to do subcontracting work on all the planes that we're selling all over the world, right? Yes, but the way that the agreement works basically means that you actually have to purchase the aircraft. And so this okay. is a large uh, area of disagreement, uh, especially within the U.S. government, who has sent letters to the Kennedy government saying, you know, you've got to make a decision. We'd like to see, you know, something something to be done here. And, and so this is this is quite a bit of, you know, discussion and uh, debate that had occurred around 2017, 28, 2019. Okay. I remember go at the time, I remember Peter McKay sitting in the mock-up of the F-35 at the yeah. time and being asked by a news reporter, it only has one engine. What happens if the engine fails? And yeah. uh, Peter McKay saying... Well, it won't. Oh, which was uh, yeah, kind of like an okay, statement. right? Yeah. Um, um, what about the idea that it only has one engine? So, I think it's important to understand what's the risk uh, and likelihood of it, right? If you look at engines of our generation, the ones, the newest ones, like the F one thirty five, which is the engine that powers the F thirty five, they're very reliable. There's only been, I believe, one recorded major incident where the engine failed. Uh, and in flight that caused the crash. Yeah. And if you look at, like, think about a 787, right? The Dreamliner uh, that uh, flies, uh, flies, you know, Boeing, you know, commercial aircraft. The engines on that are extremely reliable. So that in this generation, it's very unlikely. We may lose one or two. That that's un, that's that's a possibility. But the reality is that having two engines doesn't necessarily mean you're safer. What it because one engine can knock out the other one like it did in the, uh, I believe, the Lethbridge crash of CF-18 a couple of years ago. Yeah. So it's not like this is necessarily that much safer, especially given how reliable these aircraft are at this generation of, you know, technology. Okay. okay. The, the, the current events, uh, the situation in Ukraine, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, how much did that um, expedite the need for new fighter jets, in your opinion? Oh, I, I think there was no doubt that we needed new fighters for quite a long time. Like, I, I think that, that this is something that's been known since, you know, 2010, because we've been basically upgrading and sort of keeping our CF-18s going well past the time that they should be, you know, retired and, and sent to the scrappy, right? Yeah. Uh, we bought surplus Australian CF-18, or their versions of CF-18, their yeah. Hornets, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, they they don't have any more. They've actually replaced their entire fleet with F-35s, right? right? So, uh, I mean, it, this just basically just underlines the need for them, but it's been well known for quite some time. And if you talk to people within the fighter force, it is clear that they know that they're flying an aircraft that is basically obsolescent. Modifications might make it slightly useful, but it's not, it's by no means useful in a modern combat environment that we see, you know, in Ukraine. How soon can Canada get their hands on these F-35s? What's the what's the realistic time frame here? So the time frame is probably officially right now, uh, it says 2025, the deliveries start. 
Okay. Even where we are in the year, uh, there's been uh, there's been a crush of new orders. Uh, you see, Germany has just selected it. Uh, they're buying 35. Finland just signed their contract a couple months ago to uh, to get, I believe, 60 or so. Wow. So there's actually been quite a few new orders. So there's it's probably 2026, and then they're looking at a replacement by 2032, a full replacement of our fleet. Now, there's ways where the U.S. can kind of trade aircraft that they've already built with us, and we buy aircraft for them later on. That might expedite it a little bit, but it's it, that's it may not have that big of an effect. It may just hasten our ability to train pilots uh, to get them ready to go. Gotcha. Yeah. They're going to be busy at Lockheed Martin, I guess. Yeah. Yes. All right. So. Okay. Thank you. Really good yep. to uh, have your insight. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Richard uh, Shimuka. Read him in the National Post today, by the way. He's with the McDonald Laurier Institute. And that's it for the Rob Snow Show for today. Coming up after the new news, it's the Sam LaProud Show. One of Sam's guests today is Senator Vern White, former Ottawa police chief. Looking forward to that. Right after the noon news update from City News. The Rob Snow Show. Tune in weekdays starting at 9 on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Number one for local news in Ottawa and the Valley. program is brought to you by NHL Center Ice. Follow the teams and players you want to watch no matter